Okay, okay. So I am the county administrator. I've been with this Gaming County for 34 years. Started out on a labor truck, working in District 3, ironically. But it's been a good ride. The county's been good to me. And um, off the clock, uh, now where's Laura? Laura said I had to tell something about myself. Uh, I'm a big green egg enthusiast. I'm a barbecuer, as you can tell. Now, if anybody ever tells you that they're a barbecuer and they're only this big around, you can't trust them. Never trust a skinny barbecuer. The other thing is, I listen to all kinds of genres of music. When you get in my truck with me, there's no telling what you're going to be listening to. But one of the genres I like, I like to listen to is the old Southern Gospel Quartet style music. It's kind of fading fast these days, said my grandpa. And the doctor looked at the grandpa, and the grandpa looked a little bewildered too. He said, well, son, why do you say that? He said, because every time I walk by my grandpa, or my grandpa walks by me, he pats me on the back and says, bless your little heart. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, hey, we're here today. It's going to be a great day, positive day. We've got a few house, uh, housekeeping issues to, to uh, go through. Restrooms in the front foyer. That's always good to know that you were given as part of your badge. Don't lose the red ticket. That's lunch. So uh, make sure that you keep up with that red ticket and uh, you'll have a good lunch. I want to thank all the staff that's here. We have a lot of staff, a lot of partners here. Our staff's in blue shirts. We appreciate them coming out uh, on a Saturday and helping with this event. If you're a staff, raise your hand. They're all around the building. Give them a hand. So at any point today you have a question, not sure about something, just look up one of the blue shirts and they'll be happy to help you out. Now, uh, the centerpiece is on the table. You know, they're nice. The work really doesn't get done in the boardroom. It doesn't get done on the dais. All the theatrics of the boardroom, that's not really where the work gets done. The work gets done in the communities, gets done in the neighborhoods, gets done in community centers, walking the streets, no matter if it's fixing somebody's driveway, a drainage issue, a community park, that's where the work gets done. Nobody understands that better and exemplifies that better than Commissioner May. Some years ago, he and I were in the Dory Miller area. We were standing at the intersection of Miller Street and Park Street. And I don't know if he remembers, but he wanted to do a, a cleanup in that area, so that's what we were looking at. So two kids come walking by. And out of the blue, commissioner goes, hey, are y'all signed up to play ball? And they said, no, sir. He goes, why not? He said, well, we can't afford it. He takes his cards out and he gives it to the kids. He said, I want to hear from your mamas and your daddies. You tell them to call me, bring you to the ballpark. I got you covered. I'll pay your fees and your uniform, everything you need. You, want, you better be there playing ball for me. That's his passion. That's his initiative. That's who he is. I've seen it time and again. And you never know, you never know what that one 30-second encounter, you never know what impact that had on those two kids. I hope they signed up. I hope they followed through. But a 30-second encounter with two youth keep them out of trouble. They learn values. If they play in sports, they're learning values. They learn how to work hard. Maybe they grow up and be successful out of one 30-second encounter. And that's his passion. That's his heart. I've seen it time and time again. He don't talk it. He walks it. So without further ado, Commissioner May, come on up. Y'all give him a hand. Thanks, Wes, and we appreciate it. And we're very thankful to each of you that are here and to our staff that worked hard, uh, all of our partners, Quint Studer in his absence, we're real excited to be here. Uh, but out of protocol, we are excited that we just can't do it at a local level. Um, we have the state here, and we're very blessed to have a state representative uh, that's concerned for minority issues, women issues, workforce issues. Uh, since she's been elected, her and I have been fighting, uh, trying uh, to be very inclusive and Representative Salzman is here, and we're just going to call her to the mic even before we say a word. Y'all give it up for our state representative, Michelle Salzman. 
Okay, so I wasn't prepared to speak, but as a politician, I can always talk on the microphone. So good morning, everybody. I feel like there, there needs to be a little bit more energy in the room today. We're here to learn and grow. Yes, ma'am, that's right. Give yourselves a round of applause. I mean, it's a Saturday morning, and you came to the Brownsville Community Center for a minority event. So first of all, I, I am Michelle, I'm, but I am just Michelle. I, I grew up here. I'm from this community, and I represent the north end of the district. I'm also a member of the minority chamber. I am a woman-owned business. I own a small business. veteran, And I'm also disabled. I know I look disabled, huh? Uh, and my husband is Jewish, so we have all kinds of fun stuff uh, all around us. But I just wanted to come here to support the, the cause. I love my brother, Brian. We, we call each other brother and sister. I love him with the Minority Chamber. Lumen, my favorite commissioner. Um, <laughs> and we do a lot together. And, and I would encourage you, if you have any issues at all that you come across that you really need help with, and the county or somebody just isn't helping you, feel free to reach out to me. You can email me. You can call me, Facebook. Instagram, you just message me. I answer all of my own messages. I'm Michelle Salzman. Um, so I encourage you, if you have issues with your unemployment, with your business licenses, with your um, maybe your insurance, uh, house insurance, health insurance, uh, street issues, lighting issues, anything at all, you can call me. I promise you I will answer. I'll be there. But I'm just here really today to support the cause um, and just to say thank you to you guys for investing in this and investing in yourself and I think together we can make a difference in the community. So thank you. Thank you, Representative. Give it up for the Representative. And excuse me for my voice, uh, but I've been COVID phobic and last week I didn't wear my mask every day and ended up with a cold. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll stay away from you. And so if I don't come completely up to you and if I have my mask on, it's because of that reason. But let me just say I'm excited. This is just an extension of what we've been doing with Community Cares and our staff with Leroy Williams and Claire Long to come out. And I believe that you ought to take government to the people. You shouldn't expect for people to have to come to the government. And so rather than bring you down and advertise uh, how do you sign up to be a vendor or a contractor, go to the second floor or you know, find somewhere to park and DIB will give you, you know, a $20 ticket and John Peacock will write a letter uh, and then you'll have more tickets and no contracts uh, for coming down. For, for coming downtown. Um, so we've, we're bringing the government um, to you. And so I'm excited this morning because some people say, well, we'll never get a contract. African Americans will never get a contract. A minority will never get a contract. Well, you know, when I first was elected, we didn't have any contracts. We did less than $100,000 with African American companies. Uh, now we got ITL Solutions, a 25-year-old African American that does $7 million a year doing transportation for community transportation that employs about 20 people, 30, 40 people uh, through ITL Solutions. Uh, through our landscaping program, through our janitorial program, we had a janitorial program, then a $2 million contract, and we broke those down into small packages. And now we have people like Rodney Jones and Atari and people that are getting janitorial contracts that are able to employ their families. So we can do it. There is opportunity, and we're going to fight for those opportunities. When I sit here, I'm excited. You know, Wes gives the story of, of me being a little league coach, and I, I see Benny Washington over there, and we're, we're all little league coaches. But when I look, I see William Montgomery, who played for me since he's four years old. Now he's an entrepreneur and a business guy. I see Lorenzo Long that works with me. Now he's a business owner. Uh, so if we just invest, and I believe the greatest investment is in human capital. I don't believe the greatest investment, Mike Allen, is in roads and bridges and drainage, all we need that has been flooding. We need it. But the most important investment is that we invest in our local small minority businesses and that's how we improve poverty. That's how we take away disparities. That's how we take away detriments uh, because we don't read every day in the paper that rich black kids are killing rich black kids or middle class black kids killing middle class black kids. There are poor black kids killing poor black kids because of the socialization because they haven't been given the opportunity of the economic dream in the American dream. So that's what today is about. Uh, and we know that you are the concerned small business owners. You are the ones that are the bedrock. And so we hope that the information that you get from this place today is beneficial, and we hope that you transfer it not only to your business, but you transfer it to others who you may think are your competitors or may be doing the same service that you're doing. Share this information so we can be all inclusive. And in closing, I simply say a lot of people get caught up on diversity and inclusion. We need to bring about diversity to, well, I don't really necessarily use the term diversity, I say inclusion. Because if it's a diverse party, I invite a lot of different people, I, I invite a lot of different ethnic, ethnic groups or male and female and it's diverse and I invite you to a party and I have whatever food I think you might like, I have whatever drink I think you may drink. 
But if it's inclusion and I include you, I put you in on the planning process of how you want the party to be and what do you really like. So when you walk in, you will have that drink that you like or that food that you like. And that's what I believe about our procurement, about our contracting, about our vendors. It should be all inclusive. And if we had it all perfect, if our procurement office had it all perfect, if our contracting, uh, if our administration, if an elected official, if we had it all right, we wouldn't be at this point today. So we not only need you to gain information, but to give input to the people at the table, give input to the organizers of what you think we can do to be more inclusive to make a better community here in Escambia County. So with that, uh, I'm not going to talk any longer because I, I know I got a lot of District 3 voters and uh, we're not running for office right now. We got a couple more years, so y'all don't want to hear a politician uh, talk. But we are excited about partnering with the uh, Studer Group. Quint Studer uh, and I worked together. Uh, I personally had the opportunity for my business to be a part of Covenant with the community and a minority partner on major projects that I would not have been had uh, Quint not said that we are going to figure out how to do it and how not to do it. And so that's what it's about. It's how to do it. So we are excited today uh, that uh, Quint was a part of, of being here and the spring and he has two people. But before he does that, I do want to personally thank our partner agencies around around the tables today. Uh, we have Escambia County. Escambia County, can they raise their hand? There's a Escambia County table somewhere. Um, Mr. Levengood, I think we have a table somewhere in the back. In the back. All right, City of Pensacola, thank you so much. ECUA, thank you there in the back. University of West Florida, right over to our left, thank you so much. Pensacola State College, don't enroll your kid at Pensacola State, put him at UWF. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to increase that minority participation at UWF. <laughs> UWF. Uh, Florida Office of Supplier Diversity. Thank you for traveling down. Small Business Development Center. She, she's happy. <laughs> we, <laughs> we appreciate you being here. Gulf Coast Minority Chamber of Commerce. I think Brian was one of the organizers. Uh, he, he's filming. We appreciate that. Studer Community Institute, the spring. I think that. And so uh, I'll be calling two people to the stage. And the first one is Rachel Gillette. Uh, she ser has worked along Quint Studer, serving as the Chief Leadership Development Officer at the Studer Community Institute for seven years. With over 24 years of business and leadership experience, she is responsible for the creation of curriculum and implementation of leadership programs, customized training, conferences designed to improve skills and business results to drive SEI mission of growing jobs and improving quality of life for all people. I want y'all to forget everything I just said. Just ask her when she get up here, how can she help you get a job and make your business better? Yeah, that's all. I mean, that's it. <laughs> that's it. You, you, you know, I, I, I go to a Baptist church, man. All we want to know is win the benediction. Um, <laughs> and along with her will be a D.C. Reeves, who's the chief entrepreneur officer at the spring. Prior to the, his role as CEO, D.C. was the chief staff for the student family of companies. D.C. is an entrepreneur himself. He opened Perfect Plain Brewery, which will be giving all of y'all free beers at the end of this today at 4 o'clock. So go down there and take, take, take proof that you were here, and you can have as much craft beer as you like. There's D.C. right there. <laughs> so y'all are going to be great. Um, um, <laughs> Perfect Plain quickly became one of the best, busiest tap rooms in the state of Florida. D.C. recently authored a book, The Micro Handbook, Outlining Perfect Plain Success. Please join me in welcoming Rachel Gillette to the stage. Thank you, and we hope you learned so much. Again, thank our staff. Thank you. Rolling with Madrina. I see my main man, Miles, up there. And before Rachel comes, when you see a lot of these young people like Miles and a lot of people video, uh, it's because of our summer employment program uh, that we went and employed young people. And now we probably have 11 or 12 young African Americans who started in an intern program that we start, who are now gainfully employed uh, by Scammy County, who are doing well. And so we're very thankful for all of our interns. And Claire and Leroy, we thank God for the work that y'all have done. Rachel. All right. Amen. Thank you. I should know when Commissioner May says he's finished, there's five more minutes. <laughs> That was four. All right. <laughs> Let's give Commissioner May a huge round of applause, please. What a guy. We love him.
Wow, great to see you. I'm so excited. I love Michelle came up and she's like, come on, let's raise the energy in the room. It's Saturday morning. But wow, you guys have come out. Yes, there's my friend already. I know my friend in the room. <laughs> but come on, I am passionate about leadership development, about skills training, about growing businesses, about creating jobs. And so um, when I got asked to be here, I was like, absolutely, let me, let me get on that stage and give me that microphone. I'm all about it. But Quint was supposed to be here, and I want to extend his sincere apologies that he couldn't make it today. There was a scheduling conflict. You can imagine what his calendar looks like, and he's all over the country. But he's really disappointed that he's missed it because he is so invested in this community. And he has, as Lumen said, um, been very concerned about not just business in general, but making sure, um, as Lumen said, that we have inclusion and that he has had his covenant for the community for many, many years. So um, he believes in these efforts. He's behind them at 100%. Although he's not in the room, he's here with us in spirit. So um, I wanted to say that as we got started. But um, let me tell you a little bit about me. What Lumen didn't say is that I was not born and bred in Pensacola. Okay, I want to make that clear just in case you hadn't noticed, all right? <laughs> I am a transplant, but I am a proud a citizen of Pensacola, a proud citizen of the United States of America. I took my citizenship, gosh, been here for 19 years now, a citizen for about 12 of those, and this is home. But I grew up in Liverpool, England, and uh, I was the first person in my family to go to university. And I went there on grants because my family was poor. We couldn't afford to send me to university. And without the grants, I never would have made it, and without the help and support of others. And I was effectively also on what you might want to call the sort of free and reduced lunch program at my university. I had the vouchers that I would stand in the, in the line for the food at lunchtime and in the evening, and I'd hand in my voucher. But I loved my university and I was grateful for the opportunity to go there. And I came out with my degree in law and American studies. Do not ask me why I decided to do a joint honors degree in law, as if law wasn't hard enough. I said, I'm gonna do American studies too. And I had absolutely no idea why I did American studies. And God, you know, <laughs> puts you in the right place at the right time. And I learned all about American history and American politics and American geography and, and the social system and literature. And it was just fascinating and I loved it. But that was, you know, many, many years ago. I had no clue I was gonna end up here. What I did want to do was be a barrister, not a barista. A lot of people got that wrong. I know nothing about coffee. Ask me about tea <laughs> and we'll be fine. I can have a long conversation with you about tea because we drink a lot of it in England. But I wanted to be a barrister. And you're like, well, what is that? And when I kind of decided, it was about eight, and my uh, best friend, she said, I'm going to be a barrister. And I'm like, I'm going to be one too. Why? Yes. What is that? I don't know, but it sounds good. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, okay. And so I found out what it was, and I, I knew that what it meant was to be a trial lawyer. And I got to go to court, and I got to stand up and speak. And my sister said, well, that's a great job for you, because you love the sound of your own voice. You're going to be great at that. And you love to argue, and you always want the last word. She might have been right <laughs> now that I look back on that. So there I was, I went to college, I became a, a barrister, I did all my training and I got out and the system in the UK for being a barrister, it's effectively kind of the, the early days of the co-working space, right? So as a new, new business owner, being an entrepreneur, um, I go into this co-working space with other barristers and we share the resources and, uh, and all that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, this is gonna be great because I know all about the law. What I didn't know was anything about how to run a business. <laughs> no clue, no clue. They don't teach you that in school, right? You go to school and you learn all about the, you know, the, the torts and the criminal and the family and the this and the that, and you come out and you're so gung-ho and you're ready to get into the business. 
And uh, suddenly it's like, okay, I'm busy and I'm doing some work and I've got all this debt because I took loans out and, and overdrafts and everything else. So I've got to make some money, right, to support myself in business. So I'm working hard. And what they don't tell you as well is that you got to invoice, right? <laughs> you got to do the work and you got to invoice. And even when you send the invoice out, it takes time for the money to come in. Yeah, <laughs> and sometimes it doesn't come in. Sometimes you gotta follow up. A lot of times you gotta follow up. So my goodness, I learned the hard way of being in business, of working hard on my, on my trade, on my skill. But gosh, I mean, I made so many mistakes in the business arena and I didn't have a mentor for a long time to help me through it and guide me through the process of what it meant to, to bill and to follow up on billing and to track and to understand finances and to pay taxes. <laughs> that could come as a shock, doesn't it, when you find out about all those taxes that you didn't know about. You knew about one of them, but then there's five others that maybe you didn't plan for, you didn't know about. Yes. So, I, you know, I've been through it. I, I know the struggle. Fast forward, come into Pensacola, marry, inherit two beautiful boys. I've got two stepsons. One of them is here in Pensacola. I'm very fortunate because uh, I'm a Gigi now too. I've got four-year-old little Fiona. So she lives around the corner. So that's great. But my stepson, Ian, he has got this entrepreneur. He did go to Pensacola State College. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Anyhow, chef, that's his passion. He loves to cook, right? So he's a chef. And so he wants to get started out in business. He's got the entrepreneurship spirit too. So, you know, where do you go for funding when you're getting started? Family. <laughs> that's where you start, isn't it? Family, friends, of course. So we supported him. We give him some money to get started. And he's doing great. He's catering. He's doing weddings and he's doing parties and events and all this kind of stuff and he's got his little business going and everything's going great and then COVID right and everything that he had booked and planned and, and all the things went away all these things that affect us as, as business owners and it went away and he had a family family to take care of they needed two incomes not just one so he had to give up what he was doing and go and, and become a contractor for Lowe's and hang blinds for the last year, 18 months. Not what he wants to do, not, not you know, his passion, but you've got to make the money, you've got to bring it in. So he's back into it now. <laughs> he's just getting started back into that. And of course, we're going to be supporting him as well. But, um, you know, it's just an amazing thing that, that this entrepreneurial spirit and um, you, what you guys have here in the room. And we know it's hard and Quint knows it's hard because he's been there and he's done that too. And that's why he started the Institute. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about that today. You know, he went through his background's healthcare, as many of you know. And he was brought into all these hospitals to help them get better and teach them the skills that they needed to grow and do well in business and to be able to hire people effectively. And then once you've hired them, hiring's hard, isn't it? Once you've hired them, how do you keep them? And how do you give them the skills that you need? And he became an expert in this, so much so that he started his own company, Studa Group, the healthcare consulting company. What many people don't know is that he started it with him and Rishi and a secretary, three of them in a little rented space in Gulf Breeze. And gradually, because he worked hard like you guys do, and he kept plugging away and, and, and uh, hiring one more person and then three more people, he was able to grow the company over a lo long time and a lot of hard work to what became the Studa Group. And, and he was able to sell it. Now, what's he done with that money? He hasn't like a lot of people who suddenly become wealthy say, take off, I might have done. <laughs> I might have taken off and got on a cruise. But no, he is so passionate about this community and making it better that he has been plowing everything back into it. And when he started the Institute in 2014, I was like, man, I want to be part of that. I want to be part of that passion and that drive. Quinn had been a mentor of mine for a long time, 
And uh, I was like, gosh, if I, can, if I can get closer to him and be part of that, I feel like I can make a difference too. So we started the Institute in 2014. Next, there we go, next slide. With a mission, mission to improve the quality of life for people in the community, all people in the community. Commissioner May talks about inclusion. We're focused on that, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about that too. With this big, big vision, you know what Quint's like, big, hairy, audacious goals and vision? How can we make this community the greatest community in the world? And I'll tell you what, when I came here in 2002, Pensacola, Scambia didn't look like it did today. It's like, what have I done? <laughs> I'd come from this really vibrant community. And downtown Pensacola at 5 o'clock was like a ghost town. No bars, no restaurants, no shops, no people. Tumbleweeds down the street. I'm like, oh my gosh. And slowly over the years, because of the vision of our, our commissioners and our elected officials and private and public work that's been done, we're doing better. But we're not where we need to be. And that's why we're here today, to see what we can do better really focused on that. So, what do we do at Student Community Institute? We get asked this a lot. We looked at, originally, what makes a community great. We needed to figure that out before we can say, okay, well, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and we're, you know, we're going to focus on this. Were those the right things? We didn't know. So we benchmarked this community against communities of the same size, similar metro area around the country. How are we doing? How are we doing in education? How are we doing in crime? How are we doing in healthcare? And we built this dashboard of 16 metrics. You can see it on our website, Studer Community Institute, studeri.org. But we knew there was a lot of work to do, and we couldn't do it all, so we had to focus in on a couple of areas. Our high school graduation rate was an issue. We had 30% of kids who were dropping out before they graduated. And they just didn't have the same chance, the same opportunity. So we had to do something about that. And if you can get kids ready for kindergarten, they have got a chance to do well in school, to stay in school, to graduate from school, and then all those things that could possibly happen, uh, getting into crime, uh, under early pregnancy, so many issues, not getting jobs. Maybe we could do something about that. So we're really focused in on that early brain development and helping all our kids be ready for kindergarten. And like Lumen said, making a community better takes everybody, all these people in, this, in the room and everyone in the community. But if we don't know what the real issues are, and we don't feel like we have a voice that's being heard, we can't do anything about it. So we wanted to help more people have a voice, more people understand what the real issues are. So we're working on that with our program through Civicon, bringing in experts on all these issues that we still have problems with. Homelessness, on Monday night, we're bringing in the leading expert from around the country to talk about homelessness. Please come, it's a free event. It's at the Pensacola Blue Wahoo Stadium on Monday night, 5.30 till 7.00. And we can learn what's happened in other communities to really address this issue of homelessness. And what else? My passion, jobs, business growth. This is what it's all about. Why? Because small businesses are the foundation, the backbone of the community. All of the statistics tell us that. You go to the SBDC website, you go and see our friend from the SBDC here, she'll tell you, these are just a few of them, how important small businesses are to the community, to helping that mission that we have of improving the quality of life and growing the vibrancy. So, so important. When we're talking about small businesses, the, the definition that the Small Business Association gives it is 500 employees or less. But really, the businesses that have 20 employees or less are the ones that are making a huge difference in job growth. If we can help those businesses 
that are owner operators that have one, two, three, four, five employees get to 10 like Quint did, get to 20. Maybe we can help them get to 50 and grow. That's where we can really make a difference in the community by helping those businesses, 20 or less. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the programs that we have to help that. And I'm going to bring my, my friend and future mayor, DC Reeves, up in just a little bit to talk about some of the others. So here we go. What do we do? How do we do it? And we want you to be part of this. We have all kinds of scholarships. I got scholarships, like I said. I got grants to be able to get the skills that I needed to do my job, and so I firmly believe in them. We have scholarships available. Our programs we keep at low cost because we have amazing sponsors and partners who give us grants. We're a nonprofit to be able to help the community and do our mission. So please, if you think I could use the, this help, I could use this skill development, I could use this mentorship, but hey, I'm trying to get my business off the ground. I've got enough expenses as it is. I don't need any more. We can help you. Don't let that be a barrier because that's what it's all about, right? If we're being inclusive, we need to remove barriers and help people. So our symposiums, we gather like this, and I'm going to be gathering here. I can tell you now I'm <laughs> seeing this facility. It's amazing. Um, so we do symposiums where we bring in these outside experts, speakers on all these topics of interest, and we share their expertise with you. Very low cost, $149 for a full day of information. And we do these five times a year, and we've built it into this certification program so that you can get certified in leadership skills and business skills. Very low cost. We also have EntreCon, our business and leadership conference, coming up in November. And if you sign up for, for information from us or you drop your business card over at the table, we're going to do a drawing and we're going to give you, as uh, some lucky person here, a ticket to EntreCon in November because we want you to come and experience what it's going to be like. We're going to have a lot of fun there. We're talking about the big reset, right? <laughs> Last year, oh my gosh, affected so many of us, but we're talking about what can we do? How, what are the lessons that we can learn from last year and how can we do things better, right? And we're gonna be looking um, in our Accelerate Round Tables. These are small groups. I've been talking to a lot of you. Some of you are in them. A lot of my friends here today are in this Business and Leadership Accelerate Round Table program. And we've got plenty of spaces. We want more people to come. You'll meet once a month with a group of people who are in similar situations to you. Gosh, I wish I'd had that when I was going <laughs> through um, trying to grow my business, where I could have a mentor, where I could have people who'd been through that and could say to me, hey, you know, here's what you should do. Here's an accountant you can trust. Here's a bank that might give you some financing. That's what this is all about. We've got tons of resources and we want you to have them. So please, come and talk to us. Come and talk to my friends Gracie and Arjuna. Yes, give them a round of applause, please. These are the people who do the work. <laughs> but we want to help you. So come and see us at the table and have these resources. And I want to tell you, we are really focused at Studio Community Institute right now on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because we know as an organization, when I talk about Studio Family of Companies, we're talking about Pensacola Blue Wahoos. We're talking about the bodacious shops downtown, Studio Properties, the retail, and the institute. So all of those different entities and all kinds of different work, but we need to do a better job. Quint has been focused on it with his covenant for the community. We've been trying to, to do our best, but we're not experts. We need help. That's why we go to things like this ourselves. So we've been brought in an outside consulting company, one of the best in the country, V. Randolph Brown Consulting. He did a speech at, uh, at Civicon a couple of weeks ago talking about this. These are, these are true experts in DEI, and we're learning from them. And we know we're going to have some, some growth, some difficult moments realizing what we've done and what we haven't done in this area. But that's what we do. We look at ourselves first. We talk about it in Studio Community Institute and Studio Family Companies about holding up the mirror. Before we tell anybody else what they need to do and how they can be better, we're going to look at ourselves. What can we do? How can we be better? 
So we're looking at ourselves to see how can we improve our hiring processes? How can we um, increase the opportunities for a more diverse population within our own organization? And, and we're on a path of growth. We've got a long way to go, but we're working on it ourselves. And the goal is once we have looked at ourselves and done the analysis with the consulting company who's gonna, you know, they, they've called it, uh, what, what, what have they said? It's, um, you know, we're not gonna come in there and kind of beat you to death, but we're gonna, we're gonna give you, this is sort of a nice inquiry. But I wanna know, right, what's going on and how can we do things better? They're gonna tell us. And then we're going to use that information to grow and get better and see how we can be more inclusive. And then we're going to help the businesses that we work with too because we want this to be uh, a more inclusive community. We recently did the quality of life report with Mason Dixon. Quint's been doing that since 2008 to measure what people think about living in this community. And recently there was a question added about race. And the, and the answers came back, yeah, we've got an issue with race relations in this community. Tell us something we didn't know, <laughs> right? 85% of people said, yes, there's an issue. We need to do something about it. When you broke that down into blacks and whites, 75% black, 52% white said, yes, we've got an issue. So overwhelmingly in this community, the people feel that there is an issue with diversity, with equity, with inclusion, and we need to do something about it. So I'm grateful to be part of this effort that the county and the city are putting on. It's a long road, it's a long process, but we're on it and we're, we're looking at ourselves and then we're gonna be helping those businesses that we work with too. Not the best with this clicker, so let's go, <laughs> let's go to the next slide. All right, we're going to talk about the entrepreneurship initiatives, the, the, the spring. And this is where I'm going to bring my great friend and, like I said, your future mayor, D.C. Reeves, to the stage. Yes. What a guy. Let me tell you, I've known D.C. for many years. And to see what he has done in this community, starting businesses, growing businesses, adding jobs, bringing in revenue, attracting talent to this community is just phenomenal. So I'm so glad to know him and so glad to know that he's on this effort and that he's going to be running for mayor. D.C. Reeves. <laughs> My hype lady. Um, I tell this story all the time. Um, in 2015, when the first meeting I had with a business partner of mine to talk about this crazy idea of opening a brewery of which uh, I knew nothing about, he knew how to brew beer and I knew how to do social media. That was our, the extent of our qualification. So we're in Asheville, North Carolina, and we do what every business owner does when they come up with an idea. We Google it. You know, we just Google everything, you know, how to open a brewery. Um, and so we came across this blog, and I don't even remember, I wish I remembered what brewery it was, but somebody had been blogging their experience opening a brewery, and they say, you know, oh, you know, we got our tanks in, and we got these permits, and on and on and on. So we look and their final post, they'd gotten open and it said, you know, it took us two years, two years in the making and we got our brewery open. And Reed, my business partner and I were reading this and um, how naive we were. We're like, two years? I mean, what were they doing? Were they just hanging out? I mean, were they just taking their sweet time? I mean, two years, I mean, get the tanks in there, throw some liquid in there, turn it into beer, let's go, you know? Um, so from that point, that was um, October of 2015. And of course, naturally, two years and 15 days later, we opened Perfect Plane. So, um, you know, uh, quite a uh, humbling experience for us. We realized why it took them two years. They were a little bit faster than us. But the reality was we learned a lot through that experience that we just didn't know. Um, we pulled it, how many permits it takes to open a brewery. I now know the answer. I didn't. Thank goodness I didn't know the answer when we started because I probably wouldn't have done it. Um, it was 17. We pulled 17 permits between brewing, federal, state, local, all of those things. And um, it, it was quite a learning experience. And, you know, my background's in journalism. I always say, you, you know, when you're a sports writer, you're a little bit of a researcher. You know, you write about someone. You got to learn a little bit about them before you go interview. And so, you know, I'm, I'm 
pretty prepared to try to learn th about things that I don't know much about. And it took us two years and 15 days. We ran into issues that we knew nothing about. Um, and so even a background as a researcher, you think to yourself, well, I was fortunate enough to have a little bit of a skill set to go find answers, and we didn't know anything. Uh, we really didn't have anywhere to turn. Um, and not that people weren't helpful at, when we filed for those 17 permits, but the roadmap to get there, we had to learn on our own. That, that's what takes you two years and 15 days. Um, so what we're really excited about, and, and it's events like this, Quint is uh, gracious enough to let myself and Gracie um, we get to go benchmark all over the community, uh, or, um, excuse me, all over the country, and we did a little bit of that when we built the spring. Uh, we also, we were just in Memphis, Tennessee. I'll tell you a little bit about that um, later on Monday, um, Monday and Tuesday. We were just in Memphis trying to learn what they're doing to help their small businesses. But um, ultimately, we, all of us in this room have an experience like that, that, you know, your two years and 15 days and the, the hurdles that, um, come with business and hiring your first employee. I, I have that conversation all the time, you know, how nerve-wracking it is to hire your first employee. Um, I had, a, we were in a little tiny room uh, at DeViller Square, actually, right before we opened Perfect Plane. We had six employees. We're fortunate we've got 45 now, but we, um, uh, over four years, but we had six employees. And um, I'll never forget that feeling when you have money only going out and there's no money coming in, you know, you start writing payroll checks and you're like, wait, you know, aren't we supposed to be selling things before we start writing these? Um, something else you don't remember when you open a business is, uh, you know, you need a little runway. Um, so I show a slide to the six people that we've hired that of my checking account with 53 cents in it, it you know, and I say, in, you know, and again, people can relate to this in all different ways. When you're you own your own business, is like, guys, I'm giving. This is everything we got. You know, this is we're investing in you guys, and you guys are going to be going to bat for us. And um, so, it's hard to replicate that feeling. And and honestly, like the courage that's in this room to take on the risk like that to help grow our community and help grow jobs. Um, you know, it takes a takes a. Uh, I would I, maybe a special person. Maybe uh, you. Maybe an ignorant person that they don't know what they're signing up for, um, you know, it, but it's certainly been as rewarding um, as, as we could ever have imagined. We're at four locations now, again, 45 employees, and um, to be able to continue to help grow our community and, um, and try to give back in our community, certainly with different initiatives that we've had at Perfect Plane, to, um, which is part of our mission, to try to give back as much as we can to the community. But I'm, I'm here to kind of tell you why we have the spring. And um, honestly, if you're not familiar with the spring or you haven't been over uh, to our table, um, w we are a free resource. I mean, there's really no reason not to. If you own your own business, you, we can help you. And there's a lot of different ways we can do that. So I told you, Quint, let us uh, go around the country. Um, he said, uh, first of all, Quint was gracious enough to allow me to break away with some of my time to go open a business. and so. You know, things happen in mysterious ways and serendipitous ways. And so um, Quint was ready to say, we really have to start growing our small businesses from the ground up here. And because he was so gracious to let me go open a business, we look around the room and we're like, well, who's going to lead this effort about helping entrepreneurs open their businesses? And it's like, well, I'm so thankful that he gave me that opportunity. And in a way, I could pay him back by having the expertise to come talk to small business owners and say, hey, I've been there. You know, I've pulled 17 permits. Let me tell you what my experience has been when I signed a lease, um, how I set up an LLC. I've, I've done it. And so it was because he was so gracious to me to let me do that, that now I can pay that forward and try to help other small businesses. So Quint uh, said, oh, we went, I'm sorry, we went to Bentonville, Arkansas. It was March 25th, uh, 2019. That's, I only know that date because that's how I spent my birthday, it was uh, one day up and one day back. And uh, Keith Hoskins from Navy Federal came with us, Martha Saunders, Scott Luth from Florida West. We had a contingent that went up in the Walton family, uh, as you know, from Walmart. Uh, that's where Bentonville, Arkansas, it, you know, gets its name is the home of Walmart. Um, they had, had invited us, they'd met Quint, and they invited us up to, to sh see what they were doing in their community to help small businesses. And of course, it's amazing, the things that they're doing. And, um, and so we get back from that trip and we kind of look around the room with these stakeholders and say, 
so what's next for us? What are we going to do um, to try to do, you know, obviously, yeah, we don't have, you know, a, a company dropping $80 million into a facility that we just left. We understand that. But what can we do to start really getting our arms around the ecosystem to help small businesses? So uh, really from that trip, the, um, the spring was born. And we have a lot of great resources that are in this room, SBDC, UWF, um, PSC. And those existed before the spring existed, of course. Uh, we knew that we had pieces of the ecosystem, but our goal is to tie them together and, as we say, truly create the front door. So when I went and pulled 17 permits, I didn't know where to go. I mean, I was knocking on every door, and they'd tell me to go to the next place and tell me to go to the next place. Our goal and our mission at the spring is to, to put our arms around all of that and truly create a one place you can go um, to get that help. And we may not be the one to help you, but we know who can. Um, you know, you need to ask an attorney a question, we can get them on the phone. Um, you need to ask an accountant a question, we can get them on the phone and get them connected with you. So, as I said, if you own a business, you'd be remiss to not go pick up a business card from Gracie or Arjuna and, um, and let us be able to help you. Um, so, Quint basically came back and said, hey, um, we're going to do this. You know, you've opened your own business. We're going to launch the spring. So you can go benchmark any, you know, go take six months, go to any community in the United States that's doing this right. So uh, I said, Quint, I think the beaches of Fiji, you know, I think they have the, the ecosystem there is really nice. I need to spend three, four weeks there. You know, one of those cabanas that's like over the water, you know, I think that'll really. Um, so that was denied. So then I went to, I went to Asheville, North Carolina, Madison, Wisconsin, and actually bits and pieces of every trip we took, we have, um, that we've installed at the spring, like the MIT mentorship program. We have people that, we have our mentors in that program and uh, companies that we work with in that program are in the room right now. Um, and Brian came with us on that trip to MIT for three days to learn how to mentor uh, in a structured way. Um, so we have that that you can sign up for as we roll in more and more companies. Uh, we have an accelerator, uh, G-Beta, that Generator is one of the top, they've won every award for an accelerator you can win in the United States, every one. They're based in Milwaukee, so Quint uh, has sponsored them to come down and work with 10 companies a year here um, to get a seven-week cohort uh, with intense training that, in essence, is worth $25,000 a piece. Um, and they have access to 2,000 investors. They, they have 19 chapters uh, of the G-Beta program around the country. Um, so that's another piece. And then we just opened a co-working space over at the SCI building on Garden Street. Um, and that j literally just opened last week. And, uh, you know, we, there's more information on that uh, over there with uh, Gracie and Arjuna if you're interested in that. But, um, again, we came back from that, uh, from those trips to really say, you know, yes, we can't do it the way, maybe we're 10 years behind Asheville or Madison, but we're going to start this conversation about really, try, again, getting our arms around uh, entrepreneurship and try to get our eco ecosystem moving forward. If you go to our website, thespringpensacola.com, we have an asset map, is what we call it. And what that is, is uh, ultimately, if you need co-work space, there's a list. If you need training, there's a list. If you need, it's a very digestible, easy thing to say, if there's a question you have, you just go to the Spring Pensacola, it's on the website. Uh, we can get a copy for you if you, um, uh, you know, talk to Gracie and Arjuna over there. I'll end with this. The, um, we just got back, we talk about inclusion, and there was a striking example of this for Gracie and I when we, were, we went to Memphis, Tennessee. As you know, it's a, it's a minority majority city, 68% black, and um, it really hits home why we need to not just check boxes, but we, but we have events like this and why we need to cultivate um, small businesses and help them grow, is that in the city of Memphis, there's 39,000 white-owned businesses, business licenses, 39,000. There's 29,000 black-owned businesses. So you, know, you, you would see that number, and if you were checking boxes, you'd say, man, that's great, you know, 29,000 black-owned businesses in Memphis, that's great. Well, the, well, one of the local universities did a study, and what they realized was of the 39,000 white-owned businesses, there were thousands of those that had sev several employees, three plus, five plus, 10 plus. What they realized was of the 29,000 black-owned businesses, only 800 had more than one employee. So if you're checking boxes, you say, we're good. 
29,000 businesses, look at how many licenses we have. When you realize that only 800 have more than one employee, nothing wrong with a, a one employee business. There's a lot of successful one employee businesses, but what they realize is how are you gonna spread that throughout the community when you're not creating jobs within those businesses? businesses? So they actually started something called the 800 Project, which is they, uh, through Christian Brothers University, where uh, they actually provide services to those single employee businesses where you come in and the students that know how to do social media or marketing or whatever, the university pays those students to work with those businesses. And then they, and the entire goal of the, the mission, FedEx, of course, sponsors it, which is based in Memphis. Um, the entire goal of that is to take that one employee business and make it two, make it three, make it five. And then that's where you can really get the ball rolling with revenue. Um, so that's really striking to us. I, that was the, I talked with Quinn about that for 30 minutes on the phone. He was driving in the middle of Iowa yesterday. And that's a perfect example. Maybe we don't have FedEx to be able to do that, but we can figure out a way to have the same kind of impact or the same kind of focus on inclusion and how we can help grow our businesses. So um, ultimately, as I said, you'd be remiss to not give us your information. Um, again, Gracie Arjuna in the back corner over here. Um, everything that I just talked about is free. Uh, the only thing, co-working space, obviously, there's a membership, but outside of that, any services we have, what, you need a lawyer, you need help with an LLC, you need an accountant, all free. You just go over there and register with them. So thank you guys so much, and I'm looking forward to hearing more from you guys. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go to this next slide, one more thing. Um, one thing Quint really wanted to do for this event is, um, again, I just used that example in Memphis, if not just where things end today, where we say, hey, we got some good education on RFPs. Um, he said, how can we continue? How can we extend the impact? So uh, what we're doing is uh, we've, we've got Paul Nobles, who's going to be helping us, and um, we are going to sponsor assistance beyond this for RFPs. So if you learn something today and you say, hey, you know, I, I really like help with my pitch. I'd really like help with this proposal that I have. We're extending the impact of this beyond today. Uh, and Quentin Rishi have uh, graciously uh, donated to uh, pay for Paul's time and energy to be able to help you guys. So again, some, if that's something that interests you, Gracie and Arjuna in the back can get you signed up for that. And uh, again, thank you guys so much. All right, thanks, DC. Future politician, when they say they're done, five more minutes. <laughs> All right, we're gonna go to our next slide as we wrap up here. Um, I, I love this quote, right? Because you know, if you're not if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And so, um, strong opinions, um, using our power for positive change. Um, that's what we're all about at the Institute, right? It's how can we gather all that information, that expertise, those best practices from around the country? How can we bring those experts here? And how can we help grow this community to improve the quality of life and make it the best place for people to live? So if we go to the next slide, we always wrap up with this because it's my favorite quote. It's, it's something that Quint says all the time. I'm gonna attribute to it to him, but never underestimate the difference that you can make. Every single person, every single day has an opportunity to do something to impact a life in a positive way or in a negative way. I'm grateful to be here, to be with you today to talk to people, to learn more about you, and to see how we can be helpful to you. We appreciate you. We appreciate the fact that this has been put on today and that we can be here. So let's make the most of that and thank you. Thank you for all that you do because we know <laughs> that being in business is hard. It's really hard, right? And so if we, can, if we can have resources, if we can have tools, if we can have help, if we can have coaching and mentorship, we can make it easier, and that's what we want to do. Thank you, and never underestimate the difference you make. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Wes. Good afternoon, good morning, everybody. My name is Wesley Hall. I'm the Assistant County Administrator with Escambia County, thank all of you for coming out. We're what I consider a critical part of our show. Is
Jeffrey Lovingood is going to come up and he's going to talk to you about vendor registry. Vendor registry is the system you go into to see what kind of contract or opportunities exist. He's going to walk you through it step by step, how to register your company, how to find out what contracts are coming online six months, a year, three months down the road. So this is a very critical part. We're going to shorten this one up a little bit. We're going to run the total of about 30 minutes. Then we're going to take a break. So you guys, I know you've been sitting for about an hour, so we're going to give you a break after we're done with this piece and then we'll get back with it. But thank you all. And I'm going to bring to you now Jeffrey Loving Good. Jeffrey. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Uh, as your non-politician, I barely have five minutes, so I'm going to go through this uh, pretty quickly. Uh, I am going to ask for your help, uh, and I see a young lady doing exactly what I'm going to ask you to do. Please get out your phones and take a screenshot of this, okay? This will be easier than me handing you a business card that will get lost in your pocket, get lost in your purse, whatever the case may be. I know you have your phones with you at all the time, so take a picture of this. You'll know how to get to us. Uh, yes, this is a generic address. Because there are, uh, are multiple people there. And uh, for example, yesterday I had to uh, visit a retirement home with my mother yesterday. And so in case I'm out, I want your question to get answered. Uh, so this email and telephone number are directly to the office. You will get an answer from us. Uh, if you use these, okay? So let's see what we've got here. So what does the purchasing office do for Escambia County? Uh, I like to say that we buy, we advise, and we solicit, okay? When it comes to things that we buy, it's gonna be anything from pens, copy machines, to even bridges and fire trucks. Uh, of course, we were responsible, for, or our office was responsible for the new jail that's being constructed. So you can see that we do everything from five cents to $135 million projects, okay? We cover everything in between, and that's what we want you to be a part of, are all those projects and programs that we're working on. Uh, as far as, let's see, did I get that? Yep. As far as advising, we're responsible to Escambia County and their citizens for following the proper procurement procedure. Uh, those, there are federal, state, and county ordinances that we have to follow. So in a lot of instances where someone says, well, can't you just, the answer is probably no, because there's a law out there that says I can't. Uh, but what we do as part of our advising process is we, we don't just want to tell you no, we want to tell you how you can get from where you are to where you want to be. And that's what we know, us as being the experts on those things, that's where we're there to assist you to say, instead of saying, can't you just, how about if we take it from this and we do this and now you get where you want to be? It's not the process you thought it would be, but it's just like some of our uh, speakers said earlier. You may not always know what you don't know. And so coming in with an open mind and trying to figure out how can you get to where you want to be, that's what we're there to do f uh, for you. And as far as soliciting, there are special things that you need to know, okay? Within the county, if you were to approach me and say, I ha this is my business, I do service X, okay? If that service costs less than $5,000, you need to talk to the department because the departments within Escambia County can all spend up to $5,000 at one time. We recommend that they get three quotes, but they don't have to. So if you know what you're doing, and you go up to that department and you say, hey, I provide this valuable service and it's under $5,000, that department will handle the yes or no, okay? So they can get you what you need. I'm not the guy you wanna to talk to about that, okay? The next is anything from $5,000 to $49,999.99. So we'll just call it $50,000. Anything between five and $50,000 we have to obtain quotes. It's in our county ordinance that if I don't obtain or at least attempt to maintain three quotes, then it's not a, uh, it's not a good quote. 
So we have to get a minimum of three quotes whenever possible. And, and I'll give you a quick example of that. If I send a request through our vendor registry system, which we'll talk about here in just a moment, if I send that to 100 people that perform that service and only one person responds, I'll probably go with that one person. But then the next time around, I'm going to find out, I'm going to be contacting the 99 that didn't participate, and I'm going to say, tell me what happened. Because this is going to come up again. Because everything that we do is on a, on a contract. All contracts have an end date. So whether it's one year from now, three years from now, whatever the case may be, we want to know what we need to do better for you. And that's where that advising goes both ways. You can help us by helping us put, uh, get the information that we need so we can put you in a position to succeed, okay? And then the last section, anything 50,000 and up is a formal solicitation, and they've got all these letters here, but that just means invitation to bid, request for proposals, request for information, things of this nature. Uh, typically what we do the most are invitations to bid. Those are uh, uh, very, linear, it's very cut and dry, the low price wins, okay? So when you're performing or trying to submit on an invitation to bid, please make sure you got a sharp pencil because that's what it's going to take to win that bid. And with that in mind, I want to I make a note that Mr. Nobles, who's been hired by the spring, used to be my boss, okay? So I'm very strongly encouraging you that you utilize that service because he's got 30 plus years of experience in doing what we do. And you will, you will really miss out if you don't utilize that. Okay, next. So vendor registry is our vendor management program. It's also our contract management program. And all that means is that you have the ability to get on your phone right now if you wanted to, and you could go to, and I'll show you on our website uh, here in just a second, but you can go on vendor registry and register yourself as a vendor for the county. Now, the folks that are gonna be speaking from the school board and the folks from the city of Pensacola and the folks over at UWF and, and Santa Rosa schools, they all have different programs. I wish we could all get under one program, but that's government. All right, you're stuck with what we got. So, <laughs> so uh, vendor registry though, you log in, you create your information, you tell me how to get in touch with you, you tell me what products and services you perform, you tell me what your minority declarations are. Everything here is self-service. And once you're in our system, then there's no taking you out, all right? You'll have to remove yourself because I don't have the ability to do that, okay? Uh, let's see. Did I get that? Okay, so we're going to get into how to get into vendor registry. This is a screenshot of our uh, county website, myescambia.com. There's a rotation of pictures that come from here, but the big thing to note is the blue section there on the bottom. You are going to want to go to the part that says departments, right there. All right, if you click there, you're going to uh, be taken to the next screen, which is the purchasing office. You see it there in green. And then on the left side, this left navigation, I've blown it up on the right here. You can see that it says doing business with the county, uh, solicitations, etc. You see where it says vendor registration. That is where you want to be. All right, when you click on vendor registration, it'll take you to the place that you need to be so that you can register for free. And I wanna keep using the word free because vendor registry does like to charge people things, but I always have to make sure that people know that uh, vendor registry is paid for by the county. There is no cost to vendors to participate. Uh, some programs do require uh, that vendors pay for the right to obtain information from us, but our information is free. And so we want to make sure that you have those free options. So you can see here in the center, vendor registry is going to try and charge you, but I highlight this section over here where it says free, sign up for free. 
all right? This other section where if you choose state, if you're a little bit bigger business, you wanna do business throughout the state of Florida, any business registered with vendor registry in the state of Florida, you get this great price of $42 a month. But if you just want to see what Escambia County is doing, it's free. Free, 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 free. <laughs> Isn't that what the commercial says? <laughs> okay, so once you've set up some of your, I may have gone one too far. Oh, no, that's it. That's it, perfect. Okay, so uh, once you set up your information, your basic information for contact, you are gonna be asked for keywords. Now, the keywords that you use are gonna have everything to do with the messages that you receive from us, okay? And here you can see that I've put a couple of keywords, uh, paving, asphalt, mowing, paint, things of this nature. Now, if you add the word paint, how many different versions of painting can we do? We can do interior, we can do exterior, we can do commercial, we can do paint removal, we can do lead paint abatement, things of this nature, okay? So this first section that you put your information in is very broad. You wanna put in just the general category of what it is that you do. On the second screen, where it says number three there, products and services, that's where you're going to put in all of the specifics to the kind of painting that you do. And I'm clicking this, I promise. All right, so the next screen is going to show you. So if you use the word mowing, this is going to show you multiple versions of mowing. Roadside maintenance. I don't know if that's what you do, but if it is, you need to select the button. If you do uh, mowing, edging, planting, you can see that that button has been selected and it says uh, cl click it again to remove it. Uh, do you do slope mowing? Those guys on the side of the highway with the tractor and the one big arm, you know, so they don't tip over. These are all very specific instances of mowing. So all the services that you do, think about all the different ways that you can say it. Think about all the different ways you can apply it. Uh, if it's not mowing, maybe it's, um, maybe you own a catering business. Well, what type of catering do you do? You know, things of this nature. So you got to put all those in there. Now, the cool thing is, is that when I have a solicitation and I put in the word mowing, I'm going to get you. Your name and your business is going to come up automatically in my list. That means that when I hit send, for that solicitation, you're gonna automatically get it because you signed up for it. So just sign up for the things that you want. If you're a mower, don't put paint. I've got a guy right now that has a paint and body shop. He has signed up for every solicitation. He's never responded to one. But I'm never gonna tell him that he can't get that information because he might know somebody but he gets a lot of emails from us, all right? Uh, so put in the correct information. And then uh, the next step is gonna be the compliance. I see I've got a lot of red arrows on here. Don't worry about that. Profile verification. We're gonna ask you to update your information uh, every, every 12 months. You have the opportunity to put a W-9 in form in here. You have an opportunity to put an E-Verify. Is anybody here familiar with E-Verify? Okay, few hands. I understand. It's new. It's a new requirement, but it's about basically saying that uh, everyone that works for you is authorized to work in the U.S., okay? That's a federal requirement. So you will need to get an E-Verify number, but that's something that the folks at the spring can help you with, okay? Uh, licenses. Do you need specific licenses? Are you a general contractor? Uh, are you a cosmetologist? Are you a pastor? You know, whatever the case may be, you need to make sure that you have all your licensing set in place. Uh, let's see. And then down, as you scroll down, this is the bottom of the page. Uh, do you need a contractor's license? Do you have a business registration? Uh, it's very important that you have not only your Escambia County information, but you have authorization from the state saying that you're licensed to do business, okay? Is anybody familiar here with SunBiz? 
SunBiz is a free service. You can go look up businesses and find out who owns it, etc. We need to be able to find you in there, okay? It's also helpful if you tell me, hey, I'm in there, here's my page. You know, just print off a PDF of that. Uh, and then there's some other information. You do have the ability to do an ACH uh, transfer, but we don't really recommend giving us your banking information unless you have a contract that we're paying you for. So skip that part. All right. Once you've done that, you can view the county's bid opportunities. And that means every solicitation that we're doing. It also means every quote for under $50,000. So you can jump in at any point in the process that we're doing our daily business and you can see exactly where we stand right on day one. So you're not gonna miss anything. So from that point on, you'll see everything that we have and you'll get noticed about anything that's applicable to you. And at any time you can go back and review that information. And I can't read what that says. Oh, preview your account. Yes, make sure that your information is correct. Now, one thing I will say as well with this is that vendor registry allows you to have up to two email addresses, okay? If you only put your email address and you go on vacation and decide you don't wanna check your email, that's great. I totally understand that. But don't be surprised if a solicitation comes out the one day you're off. Okay, that's just uh, Murphy's Law, as they say. So I strongly recommend that you utilize a backup account, whether it's a friend, a spouse, uh, whatever the case may be. Maybe for your organization, you have a general sales at mybusiness.com, okay? Feel free to utilize those things and uh, make sure that they're in place. Now, once you get to our solicitations, you'll see the top Half there is listed as quotes. Those are all under 50,000. And then a sealed solicitation. Those are all the things that are 50,000 and up. And so the, the one thing I would point out is that anything that you see, uh, this next to the la last one on the bottom here, it says PD 20-21.048. PD is just stands for purchasing document. That means it came from my office. Okay, some of these others, the uh, NED, uh, that's Neighborhood Enterprise. We have some other folks that do some different things. So again, they participate in vendor registry. They use the same information we do. You'll still get the same automatic notifications, whether it's from my department or not. Okay, uh, and that's what it looks like. Let's see. This is a list of all of us in, uh, in the purchasing office right now. Uh, Randy Burns, my manager, is uh, at the back table right now, and uh, he's, he's available for questions. Uh, and of course, Buzz Roganbuck, myself, Lawrence Gordon, and Scott Larson, we're all there to assist. All right. Uh, I think we're going to hold off questions for now until uh, everyone has had an opportunity to speak. And now I'm going to bring up Allison from the school board. I didn't even five minutes yet. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Good morning. Thank you for coming out. It's a great crowd. Like you said, I'm Allison Watson, senior purchasing agent. Just a little bit about me. I've been with the district uh, going on 24 years, but I've been purchasing going on 29 years. I feel so old. Um, so <laughs> so it's, a, it's been a, a joy, a lot of challenges. I think the biggest thing uh, coming to the school district was I came from private industry, and I was so excited to work for the school district because in private industry, you're always worrying about profit loss. So it was always about you know, making that target at the end of the month. Going to the school district, it was going to be about helping educate children and really having an impact on a generation of people and, and changing lives. So just a little background, we have a minority vendor outreach initiative. Uh, we had launched this in the fall of 2019. I had started going out into the community, uh, and then COVID hit 2020, everything shut down. 
So this uh, expo gave us a great opportunity to get back out to the community and let people know that we're out here. We want to be a good community uh, partner because we see that businesses have really been hurting, in particular minority businesses have been hit at three times the rate as the other small businesses. Okay, and we see how this clicker's gonna go. Thank you. So what are the objectives? We want to um, educate the minority vendors on how to do business with the school district. We want to provide a best practices for quotes, bids, RFPs, and construction. Uh, we want to encourage registration, certification with the uh, OSD office and how to utilize their resources. And they're here with Bruce. Bruce is here, so go to his table. Um, and we want to increase our partnership with local minority organizations to promote vendor uh, events. I've been working with Brian, I've gone out to women's groups, so I'm going to be getting out more into the communities to, to develop our partnerships. Um, last, to uh, counter a community perception that business opportunities are not available for minority vendors with the school district. I think there's, well, I've seen by talking, there's two reasons. One, people don't know our system, and then people just don't think of the school district as a business. First thing that comes to your head is education. You don't really see the business side of it. Okay, I won't bore you too much with the definitions, but this is how our school board rules, and they define, you know, minority uh, vendors. Uh, the highlight of the first bullet is, you know, employ 200 or less permanent full-time employees, your net worth uh, less than $5 million. You engage in your business transactions uh, based in Florida, 51% uh, owned, managed uh, by which group you're in. Uh, the veterans, you know, your service disabled veterans business, uh, 51%, and you were wounded in the uh, active line of active duty. Really excited about that. I'm from a military family, so I'm really excited to uh, start uh, getting out and meeting some more veterans groups. Okay, our guidelines, and as I said, we all have different ones, so don't say, why is this unit doing this one and the other ones are doing something different. Uh, for us, uh, purchases under $10,000 require a minimum of one quote, okay, a minimum. As purchasing agents, we can require more depending on what is, you know, going to be purchased. Um, and, and that threshold would usually with our P cards, so a lot of that stuff won't even come to my desk. It will be done at the school level. Um, Purchasing for, uh, from 10,001 up to, you know, the 49,99 requires three quotes or an existing bid contract. And what that means is we can piggyback in our language. That means if the county has a bid contract, I can use it, you know, so we go back and forth and we kind of share with each other. <laughs> or it's a sole source designation. Just think of something like a copyright. That's the only place I can get it. So we will designate you a sole source. Um, purchases from 50000 or more are going to be a formal bid solicitation uh, or an RFP. An RFP is for services, so um, uh, the bid is more for commodity-based items. Or again, piggyback of an existing contract or you're going to be sole source. Now just so for our bids, before I forget, uh, we do not mail out bids. We do not uh, maintain a vendor list anymore. We used to when I started, but we tried to, you know, move with technology. So we post our bids on our, our purchasing website. We also post on DemandStar, uh, BidNet, and uh, Prime Vendor. Okay, so just an overview. So just as I was saying, we are a business. Uh, this fiscal year, 2021, we made a f almost $409 million of purchases, okay? So just to give you some opportunities so you can see where you may fit uh, with your business. Um, opportunities for small dollar purchases under the 10,000. Uh, you know, go to the schools, go to the PTA clubs, uh, booster clubs. If you have, you know, specialty items, t-shirts, you know, trinkets, that may be a great venue for you. Uh, let's see for the next one, custodial maintenance, janitorial supplies, small repair, installation work. Um, if you're uh, educational consulting, professional development, our Title I office curriculum instruction, if you have a training program, that may be your area. So we go to an opportunities for the large dollar um, purchases, over 10,000, over to over 50,000. 
Um, again, custodial maintenance, those will be on a quote or a bid RFP uh, solicitation. Facilities planning, that's our construction division. Uh, they deal with if you're a general contract or a subcontract. Now we have facilities planning is separate from purchasing. They can issue their own bids, RFPs, because they handle construction. What I do is I support them. I basically do all the purchasing end of their bid awards. So when you get a, uh, if you get a contract with facilities planning, you're going to see my name on it because I support that division. Again, if you have a bureau consultant and you have a big training program that you want to pitch, you know, there's opportunities in Title I and curriculum. So I tried to break down three different areas by threshold so you can see, hey, there may be opportunity for me to get in with the school district. Okay, so best practices. Um, like I said, I've been doing this a long time, and I think all my counterparts will probably ag agree with what I put up on the, on the screen right here. And uh, so just wanted to put something together because the reason you may not be succeeding is because you're doing the same thing that's wrong over and over again, or you don't know how to do it the right way. So best practices for quotes, bids, RFP solicitations, and let me just disclaimer because it always happens. Someone says, well, I did everything you said and I still didn't get it. This does not guarantee that you're going to get a contract. These are just ways to help you become more successful in that endeavor. Okay, so put that out there. Um, one, you know, read the entire document twice so you can fully understand the terms and conditions, specifications, or scope of work. Uh, these are legal documents, um, so read it, put it down, and go back to it. Make sure you, know, you have a full understanding of it. Highlight the dates and times to submit your questions, samples, and response. We get things late. If we give you a date to send in a sample and it comes in the next day, we're not going to accept it. So you know, highlight that as you're going through that document. Just, just highlight all the dates and times. Um, Go to our website uh, for the current or prior uh, bid RFP uh, award uh, tabulations. There is so much information on our purchasing website. We have an archive from the year 2000 of all the bids and RFP solicitations. So you can go and see the tabulations. You can go see who was awarded. You can see the pricing. So next thing, when you return your documents, we should be able to read them. We get stuff and you just, I don't know what it is. And I'm like, what is that? So make sure, I always tell people, send it in like, you, you know, I'm going to send you a lottery check. You want to make sure that I can read your name, address, everything. So make sure that we can read it. And with a reference the solicitation number on additional sheets. Because if it's, uh, you know, blank and we don't know where did it go, what document are you, you know, talking about? So make sure everything is attached to that original document. Um, and just prior to submitting, you know, review your response to uh, ensure that all the required attachments, copies are included and signed. It is just heartbreaking to get a document back and you can see the time and effort that they put into it, but they forgot to sign it. So therefore, we can't use it. And for us, we are a school district, so be ready for fingerprinting, Jessica Lunsford Act. So fingerprinting or background check requirements. And then the last one is just um, be realistic about you know, what you can do and don't overpromise. That's the worst thing you can do is to go out, get the contract, and you can't perform because that's just going to hurt you in, in, in the future. So best practices for construction opportunities. Again, do your homework. Uh, the facilities planning, they have a website. It has a lot of information. It has what uh, projects are out for bid. It has the uh, uh, tabulations and awards. It also has um, how do you get pre-qualified. It has uh, you know, a list of all the pre-qualified contractors with the district um, at that time. Learn the process to get pre-qualified. There's um, a woman, Linda J uh, Johnson. She, uh, I'll give you her contact information later but she will go through every step of the pre-qualification so that you can understand it, because that is our system. You have to be pre-qualified with facilities planning. 
Um, you know, so once you see that list of the pre-qualified contractors, use it for networking opportunities. Let them know that you're out there. Hey, I'm a minority business, you know, I'm subcontractor, so forth. You know, so take that list and use it for networking opportunities. If you're a subcontractor, again, you know, let everybody know you're out there. Take a chance. Go through the list and say, huh, call them. Can I get a meeting? Can we talk? I'm here. People are looking to contract with minority subcontractors, especially if it's federal dollars are involved. So that's a great opportunity to go ahead and, and use those resources. But again, facility, if you're in construction or looking in that area, go to their website. There's a, whole, a lot of information there that you can use, and you can make your strategy from that. Again, and here's some general best practices, and I'm going to I guess, uh, tell you some things that I've been dealing with lately. Um, I've been working with a minority vendor, new to our system, and I'm, I've been really impressed with this person because they are hustling. You know, I've been hearing the stories. We're not robots. We hear the stories. You know, business had to close, you know, doing everything to keep it alive during the shutdown. So I've been really like, I have an opportunity for you. You know, made a reservation for a, a data service. And I'm like, I need this paperwork. It was, you know, her date was two weeks away. I said, I need the paperwork. I need, and you know, I made it as simple as I, as I could. And every time I'm talking to the person, I can hear them, they're working. They're trying to get to the next gig. And I get that. And I'm like, I, I, I feel you, but you, I need the paperwork. We're government. So when I say paperwork is not an inconvenience, it can't be. You know, people say, oh, paperwork, paperwork. Well. You know, paperwork is the only way that we can show that we're um, in compliance with laws and regulations. That we're, we can show that we are being good stewards with the taxpayer money. So that paperwork is not inconvenience. So, you know, I, I just felt as though I could hear her just hustling, trying to get to the next gig. And I'm thinking, you know, that's when I said, your business operations should match your level of passion for your work. And if that's just not, paperwork's not your thing, have somebody in your office that loves to do paperwork that's going to keep up with it. Because what happened with the situation with this uh, minority vendor that I was really, I mean, I was going overboard. She was like, well, I'm, I'm not here until 8 o'clock. So I'm emailing at 8 o'clock. Hey, you know, I need this. You know, when is it going to happen? And she, um, it's coming, it's coming. And uh, two days before we were getting to her event date, and she promised that she was going to, you know, return it. Uh, she says, well, I got an unexpected gig, and that's why I didn't get to it, but I promise I'm going to send it to you. Well, she, you know, I did get it, but it was incomplete. And I was like, well, you're missing this and that, and didn't have time to recover from that. So she missed the, you know, missed the event. And this was going to, I was told her, I'm working on a pilot program right now, and this can lead to a yearly, um, you know, situation. So you think... You have your, you know, you're out there, but she went for that small gig instead of doing the paperwork that prevented her, you know, from participating in a program that could go from a stable yearly, you know, uh, partnership. So it leads me into strategic planning. You know, you, you grab the short term and I get it. You're struggling. You got to make sure you, you don't have payroll, you know, everything's going to keep going before the end of the month. But you got to think short term now, long term. Recognize growth opportunities. I don't know how often you're going to have a purchasing agent calling you, you know, following up, you know, because I really wanted to help this person. I really admired the hustle and, and devotion, you know, to the business. But she didn't recognize that. And that, that really hurt me. You can, and you can ask my coworkers, I've been really, you know, really disappointed. Um, and so just in, you know, conduct yourself in a professional manner. Like I said, I'm working on a, a program. I'm making reservation dates. So when I send the email to RSVP, I can't even get people to reply. When I say, please reply to con you know, confirm receipt, I can't even get them to say, hey, I got it. So I'm, I'm having to call to follow up because I want this program to work because I see that we as a district can be a good community partner. We can help you know, rebuild our minority business base. And so, you know, I have support. I, I pitched it to our superintendent. He's all behind us. So I really want, you know, I really want this. So 
I'm just like, I can't even get people to return an email that they got, you know, a confirming RSP, RSVP. So, and, or they're telling me they're going to do it and they're not doing it. I, you know, talked to this guy three or four times and he was like, oh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. So I follow up because his, his date was coming up that he had, you know, orally confirmed with me and I'm like, I need my paperwork. And he's boarding a plane. He says, oh, I can't talk right now because I'm getting ready to sit down on the plane. I'm like, really? And then he says, I'll call you at 9 o'clock tomorrow with the information. Did I get a call? No. So that's what I mean. Conduct yourself in a professional manner. All, you know, all you have to do is email me, sorry, I can't do it, or give me a date and time when you're going to return it back. Because you know, I'm really trying to, you know, like I said, I'm not a robot. I see, I see what's going on but you have to let me help you. And, and then I'm gonna leave that project alone, but uh, protect your reputation. Uh, trust and integrity matter. So I'll give you another scenario. I've got a lot of stories. <laughs> um, I had a, I'm in a contract with a vendor for a critical item that is used in every school, okay? So place a purchase order and then all of a sudden, he says, well, I can't ship it. Uh, he wants a 40% increase. I'm like, wait a minute, we're under contract. Well, the market conditions. I said, well, I understand that, but you know, we're in a contract. There's no language for me to adjust the pricing. We just can't you know, adjust the pricing if it's not in the contract. And in my contracts, I have a sentence saying, by signing this, you are honoring to agree to this price for the full term. You know, we were still within that year contract. And I said, well, you know what? Um, I understand the situation, you know, everything's going up, but right now I'm in a jam. I am stock out, I need you to release that shipment. And he says, okay, so he started out at 40%, then he's gonna come down to 28%. I said, I still can't do anything because it's not in the contract that's gonna allow me to, you know, move to a new price. So, get to the end. He's, his best offer was 28% increase. So needless to say, he defaulted, and it's in our attorney's office. But I still need to get material. So I go out, I get three quotes, and the quotes, yes, prices went up, but my quotes were 18% to 21%. So I'm like, wow, he's exploiting this, because I can get you know, something for 18%, and his, his best offer was 28%. So that's why I said trust and integrity. If you know, it matters. It really matters. And your reputation is like your name. You know, I, I tell my junior purchasing agents, you know, protect your name. That's gonna be with you forever, even if you switch jobs. You know, and protect our entity, whatever entity you're working for, because you represent that entity. So enough of that. <laughs> So let me, let me just share some of uh, vendor resources. And like I said, I'm, we have a great partnership with OSD, so I'm gonna give them some you know, love and attention. So <laughs> uh, you know, we participate, they have a great uh, exchange events that are gonna be coming up and they can tell you all about that. You know, they can help you uh, navigate the state government with points of contact. Um, they can help you uh, to get uh, certified and to maintain your certification. And the district, we use them, you know, they, their database because, you know, we plug in with them and to say, okay, this is how we can do our reporting. So when you register with them, you're going to get into our system as a minority of vendor status. Let's see. And then I'm really excited. Like I said, I'm from a military background, family. And um, so was able to develop a relationship, you know, with the uh, economic development specialist for the veterans uh, representative for North Florida, uh, the SBA, U.S. Uh, representative, and they have great resources, you know, uh, free business counseling, contracting, uh, SBA uh, guaranteed business loans. So there are resources out there, just tap into them. Okay, and last, how do you contact us? Okay, you can go to our website uh, for our purchasing. I, I'll be your point of contact, but it will have, you know, I'm not the only purchasing agent, so we are broken up by commodities. Um, 
my main commodities now, I've done a lot of them throughout my years, but my main one now is food, food services. And I'm really passionate about that because I know it's not always about contracts. You do this for a while, it could be shuffling papers from one contract to the next. What I'm passionate about food services is because I know I'm feeding 40,000 kids. And if I do my job well, I know kids are gonna have breakfast and lunch when they come to school. So, you know, you have to get it, you know, on our side, because we're not in the classroom. I don't see the kids every day. But I, for me, I have to bring it back why I, my passion is for doing my job. And it's always about the kids. I have, you know, pictures of the kids on my wall. So when I look up from writing a 100-page contract, I know why I'm doing it. So always bring it back for us, for me, working for the school district, back to the kids. Um, you know, like I said, facilities planning, go to their website, Linda Johnson, she's gonna be a great uh, point of contact. Like I said, she will step by step go through the pre-qualification process for the department. Um, our maintenance department, Jim Higgins, he is the assistant director. Uh, Jim Beagle, he is the manager of the custodial department. Title I, Dr. Laura Colo, uh, professional learning, that's for you know, any consulting work. Ryan Alabak, he's a director, and um, OSD. Uh, Ashley, she is not here today. Um, and then, like I said, I'm super excited to be starting to work with our veterans uh, representative, uh, Natalie Hall. Um, so I've got her information. I have this information um, at my table, so you can you come by if you want it. I can give you a copy of it. But um, thank you very much for uh, being here. And I guess we'll save Q&A for later. <laughs> so uh, next, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jose from the city of Pensacola. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, so my name is Jose Goodwin. I'm the Assistant Purchasing Manager with the City of Pensacola. So I'm gonna take you through how to do business with the City of Pensacola. All right, come on now. Some of the objectives we're gonna cover. Brief overview, brief overview of uh, City of Pensacola purchasing. We're gonna go over uh, procurement requirements. type of business enterprise programs we have with the city. Program requirements and benefits. And then how to get certified. I think I need longer arms. Okay, when you read all of this up here about our role in uh, purchasing, all of this comes down to our job is to make sure our departments, we have roughly around 16 of them, make sure they get what they need, when they need it, where they need it, at a fair competitive price, and the process is done fair and legal, okay? So, whether it's dealing with the port, airport, Pensacola Energy, police department <laughs> or fire department. We make sure all those guys get what they need, whether it's uniforms, anything, okay? Whether it's uh, building a fire station or replacing a police car, no matter what it is, we make sure they get it. So you will see out of all the agencies who've been up here, all of our thresholds for spending, they're different, okay? So it's best uh, being at a place like this and seeing this is, is good. So with this, for the city of Pensacola, from zero to 500, um, we don't need quotes. So those departments can go right out to the vendor and pick up what they need, okay? Now granted, for uh, $500, under $500, not much, but still, okay, depending on what they need, they can get it. 
from 501 to 10,000, and really, no matter what, over 501 or 501 and above, they're going to need three quotes, okay, if they can get it. Three quotes required. Then sometimes, depending on what it is, they can't obtain three quotes, so we go from there. Over 100,000, uh, we're definitely going for a bid, a formal bid, unless it's under a contract or something like that. Just like other agencies, if possible, we'll, uh, depending on what it is, we might piggyback an another contract to get that uh, piece of equipment or whatever it is. So for us, let me go over here. For us, we put our bids um, on our website. Also, we use Demand Star and Florida Online Bidding. All right. Biggest thing I would say, definitely go to our website to look at, because the website is free. Granted, I don't know if there's a cost um, with Demand Star or Florida Online Bidding, but for free, on to our website, all right? Responses delivered to our purchasing office in a sealed envelope. That's very important. Whatever you do, when you look at that solicitation and you open that bid, make sure you read it very carefully, it's, you know? Uh, is all about the detail of it, okay? Read every bit of it, because if not, you might miss out on an opportunity. Deadline established for the responses, and no response accepted after the deadline. All that information, again, is in that solicitation, all right? Bids are open publicly. Now, a long time ago, we had a bid, it was a huge contractor bid, construction bid. And um, especially in construction, you know, I tell you that the competition is very fierce. So um, a lot of competition. So our uh, purchasing office is on the sixth floor. It's a nice glass conference room. So I guess the, uh, the, the contractor may, he probably gave the bid to a, a newbie and say, hey, take this to the purchasing office. Well, obviously, he didn't, that person who gave him that bid didn't also tell him, say, hey, you need to take it to this certain location, because that's what the, you know, what it told us to do. So he gets up to the sixth floor, he see a whole bunch of people in the conference room, so he said, ah, oh, I guess that's where I need to be at. He walks up in there, whole bunch of construction guys up in there, and next thing you know, hey, I walk through the door, a whole bunch of bids. The guy said, hey, here's my bid. I said, oh, I can't touch it. And then you can hear someone in the background say, one down. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he just missed that opportunity. Exactly. You see? Now, one of the guys could have said, hey, hey, take that bid to the front office. That's where we put a stamp it at. That competition, I tell you. So that means make sure you read that information so you can take that bid where it needs to be. All right, so for us, for the city of Pensacola, you go to www.cityofpensacola.com. That's our forward slash purchasing. That's how you get to our website. If you click the top where it's the current bids, you can see all the bids that we have out currently, okay? You can also see the ones in the past that's done, but uh, all the current bids would be uh, up. If you want to receive notification, you click, it's at the top, but you click a little button like that, it says sign up to receive text message or email. It'll take you to a page like that, and you just click on which one that you want. All right, so it'll send you an email or whether you want text message whenever new bids come out. Now again, if, depending on what we're looking for, and depending on the time frame, okay, if there's another contract out there, say a GSA contract, state contract, we might piggyback it. Okay, if we piggyback it, that means I don't need three quotes. We go straight for that. But a lot of times we do that only if uh, it all depends on the time and how, you know, what we need. Now, that just popped up. So for all these bids, you'll notice 
The, the, the one you'll see most on our website is ITV, ITB. The biggest thing, that word is circle, responsive, okay? And when we talk about making sure you submit a responsive bid, that means that everything that we asked for, you put it up in there. You gave us everything that we asked for in that bid, in that solicitation, okay? So on the ITB, a lot of times for us, we have a quantity sheet. And in that quantity sheet, you're gonna list, you know, the item, and my, you know, quantity and dollar amount, okay? For that, and you need, to, you need to put a dollar amount in each line item. So if you skip a line item, saying, oh, well, I'm not gonna bid for that line item, so I'll just skip it. Well, still you're not giving us what we asked for. So you at least put zero dollars if you're not gonna do that. Don't just skip the line item, okay? We look for a dollar amount on each one. Components of our bid package, advertisement, it goes out for 30 days. Cover page. That bid opening information, right there. Very important, and that's in the cover page part, okay, when you're looking at it. Because you wanna make sure you get that bid where it's supposed to be at the right time. Most of our bids are due at 2.30, all right? And we're there with a clock. Matter of fact, it's two of us. Exactly, it's two of us watching a clock. So that if you get there and say, no, I'm here on time, what does both of us say you're not? <laughs> okay? So, but the thing about it is, you make sure you get there early so we can stamp it and put, we, you know, sign it in. All right, you want that to happen. But you're gonna get that information on, at that, um, you know, on the cover sheet. General conditions, requirements, rules that govern how the bid will receive, evaluate, and award it. Scope of work, depending on what it is, insurance specifications, product or construction specification, a lot of times we put a sample of the contract so you know exactly how some of the wording is going to look. All right. We'll get back to just making sure you please you, uh, whenever you set up your business, make sure you are checking that information to make sure it's correct in the system because that's very important because we go on like, uh, for instance, um, uh, what is it, uh, Sunbiz and all that stuff to look up because when you look in some bids, it tells you exactly, you know, some of the structure in your business. Construction plans, drug-free workplace certificate, federal department uh, certification, uh, signature and proposal page, and also SBE, MWB, and VBE utilization documents. So we have three different business enterprise program, VBE, SBE, and then MWBE. So, God darn it, go back, right. I think I'm getting, all right. So uh, Pensacola's VBE program Ordinance number 0915, of course, is intended to increase business participation among veteran-owned businesses. Now, for the city of Pensacola, we define a VBE as a business that has been certified by the Department of Management Services to be a certified veteran business enterprise as set forth in section 295.187 of the Florida statute and has a principal place of business either in Excambia County or Santa Rosa County. All right. Now, just remember, the city of Pensacola, we don't certify you. The state certifies you, okay? So if you type OSD in your, on your, um, in your browser, this will come up, all right? Click on Get Certified. 
you'll see a page like this. Click on veteran owned small business. Page like this will come up. You'll see where it says eligibility requirements. Click that. It'll take you to this page right here. All right. And then if you need assistance, then there's information at the bottom of the page for you to call OSD so they can help you out. All right. But when you, if you're using that preference for VBE, you need to make sure that you're certified before the bid date, before that bid opening, okay? And you have all that proof of information inside your bid. Or whether it's a quote. So then we have a uh, SBE program. SBE, of course, is to increase business participation among small businesses, all right? And to uh, create contractor and subcontract relations, which goes beyond. So you must be located in Escambia County, Santa Rosa County, have at least as 50 or less full-time permanent employees, and also a net worth less than a million dollars. Again, you go to our website, www.cityofpensacola.com forward slash purchasing. Now, the thing with the city, um, we're not all, some of our programs right now, for instance, our, um, for our vendor application and SBE, those applications are hard copy, they PDF, okay? So we'll be rolling out a new module um, so it's just like our MWB program where you can do it all online. But for right now, um, you go to our website, vendor application, and also our SBE application. If you don't meet the requirements for SBE, I always say, fill out a vendor application that'll get you in our system, because you want to be in the system. If there's a need within any of our departments, They'll reach us and they'll say, hey, send us a vendor, a vendor list of whoever can provide us this commodity or service. We go in our system and generate that list. So if you're not in it, your name is not on that list to that department. How do you get on that list? Is that vendor application. Or if you do the SBE application, you, you get on the list as well. Vendor application look like this. After you fill it out, it's very simple. You fill it out, and then at the top, uh, you just email it to purchasing um, at cityofpensacola.com, and it'll come to all of us. It's only three of us in the office, so we'll take care of it. Or you can bring it up to our office at City Hall. Uh, purchasing will located on the sixth floor. So if anything, if you're in a hurry, just tell the security guard, I'll come down and pick it up for you. Vendor, uh, small business enterprise um, program application. This one's a little bit longer, okay? Because there's actually a, um, what is it? A balance sheet that you have to put with it, okay? And some other information in order to, uh, for us to uh, verify some information. With both of them, we deal with NIGP codes, okay? So all of those will ask you for an NIGP code and you just check them off. And that's how I get in, your, in our system. Uh, just the way the county talked about earlier. Um, for NIGP, sometimes there are three digit codes. We deal with five. So it really um, nails it down specifically what type of service or commodity you're going to provide us. So MWBE. Now this program is designed and create it to increase business participation among our minority and women-owned businesses in the city of Pensacola. Some of the benefits, increase opportunity to participate in the city's purchasing and also construction opportunities. Being part of a business network with prime vendors. Being listed on the city's MWB directory. That directory is listed, is, is on our website. So other agencies actually look at it. 
uh, opportunity to create new uh, contract and some contractor relation, increasing business opportunity outside the city realm. And that's the thing about it, because when we have uh, prime contractors who uh, win certain bids, um, once you jump on board with them and you do a good job, you never know. They use, use you for other projects, you know? Now, this program is a lot different from the other program, and I would say that. You need more paperwork because we have to really verify. We go really deep into verifying the company to make sure you're actually uh, a women-owned business or minority-owned business. I get back to saying, make sure you look at your paperwork very carefully. I don't know how many businesses I say, hey, I need to see your Schedule K-1, or I need to see X paperwork, and I get it. And I come back to them and say, you're actually not the majority owner of your business. And they're like, what? Yeah, you're not. So please look at your paperwork very carefully, go through it, and just uh, verify it before you send it to us. Be owned by a U.S. citizen, uh, lawful admitted permanent resident. Uh, owner must, be, must have the expertise normally required by the industry. Uh, but uh, business must be for profit. You must be registered in some biz. Uh, must be located either at Scambia County, Scambia County, Santa Rosa, Okaloosa, Walton, or Mo Mobile, Alabama. You must have licenses required, local, state, and federal. Uh, must be in business for at least a year. Now this is what I always say. We do have a one-year requirement. And I always say this. If you, don't, if you have not been in business for at least a year, get certified with the state. I always say that. Why? Because once you get certified with the state, now I need less documents. So easy. And it's good for you too. Good for all of us, all right? So definitely get certified with the state if you have not um, met that one-year uh, business requirement, uh, business operation requirement. Uh, have its daily business operation managed and controlled by one or more minorities or women individuals. And that's another thing we talk about. So you read all this right here. We talk about owner must be in charge and have ruling power over daily operations. And we talk about must have an overall understanding along with the managerial and technical know-how. It gets all down to it. You must be that person where the buck stops. Okay? You need to be able to do it all in a sense. And granted, I know how things are chopped up in a business. But you have to have, you, you need to be that person. You can sign the contracts and stuff like that. And that's where it gets back to, again, I always tap on saying, make sure you look at your paperwork, make sure your paperwork in order. Because again, when we talk about contracts, we have, granted, you have a, a corporation or you have an LLC. Now, for instance, LLC, and you have managing members. For the city, when we look at that contract, when we send you a contract, now two managing members, two members will sign that contract or the managing member will sign the contract, okay? Now, where can we see some of that information? Exactly, all right? So please make sure you have, and the same thing for a corporation. We see a lot of information in some biz. So please make sure your information is up to date in the, in the system. Some of the information that we'll ask for Proof of resident, they might ask for, uh, you might submit a driver's license or voter's registration, uh, your professional licenses. Depending on how your business is structured, we might ask for a Schedule K-1. Might be a G. Depending on, how, again, how your business is structured. Article of corporations, organization. We get back to the five-digit NIGP codes that you'll put up in the system, all right? And then also W-9. Now again, if you're currently certified with the Florida Office of Supply Diversity, or FDOT, 
for the Florida Minority Supplier Development Council. I need less documents. So again, if you have not met that one year requirement, get certified with those guys because they don't have that. And then once you get past it, come back to us. So some of the changes that we made, we have what we call, uh, so we have uh, what we call participation goals assigned to a lot of our construction projects. So for example, say if I, I'm a prime vendor, prime contractor, on a, um, and I'm bidding for construction, inside that bid it will say, um, it will give a number, say for instance 5% participation goal. That's telling the bidder that 5% of the base bid must be subcontracted to city certified MWBEs. Now, in order for you to, for them to reach out to you, you must be certified to be on that list. All right, but again, for that bid, for that, pri for that prime contractor, for his bid to be responsive, he must reach down to city certified MWBEs and bring them into that project, all right? So I can't stress enough about getting certified. The city maintains a database identifying uh, certified MWBEs, and that's on our webpage. Now, the prime vendor, they'll only get points if they're using a cert city certified MWB and they're done, they're, uh, you know, certified before the proposal date, the due date, and also they perform it in the area that they are certified in. So they can't just say, I'm just use that person. You must be on that list. I can't stress that enough. Good faith efforts. Now sometimes, Sometimes there's, uh, we get in, into a, a situation where the prime vendor, he tries hard, but he's unable to meet that uh, participation goal, all right? So what we have is good faith efforts. So for good faith efforts, in order to increase utilization, he must um, achieve, accumulate 70 points in order for his bid to be responsive, meaning there's a list of items he must do Say, for instance, notification of subcontracting opportunity is 10 points. Say, for instance, joint venture, 20 points. Breakdown work, 15 points. Host pre-bid meetings, 20 points. So he must accumulate 70 points, do all this stuff in order for his bid to be responsive. Now, a lot of bidders, prime contractors, they would rather go with the uh, meeting the participation goal, because in order for them to get the good faith efforts, because um, we have to verify everything. So just like uh, Allison talked about paperwork, they have to submit us even more paperwork for us to verify what they have done for outreach to minority businesses to bring them in for good faith efforts. And if they don't provide us all that paperwork, then their bid is non responsive. So and then, you know, they could have, you know, uh, lost a million dollar project for not providing us that information. So a lot of them just go out for, to meet their participation goal. But again, I can't stress enough, get certified. So for that program, it's not gonna impose quotas. We don't do set aside or provide a bid preference. All right. To get started, go to our website, www.cityofpensacola.com forward slash MWBE. That's how you start the process. You'll know you're in the right place when, when you go to that website, you see that cool dude right there <laughs> at the top. You know you're in the right area. All right. And if you have any, if any um, questions, you just give me a call. Read the requirements. 
And then you just click at the bottom where it says online MWE certification application and you'll start the process. It'll take you to a page like this and then tell you to prompt you to create an account if you're not in the system already. And then uh, if you have any troubles, trouble with the um, technical side of it, no matter what, give me a call. But if it's technical with the, the program itself, those guys would be able to handle it, okay? That's, oh man. <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> Can you go back to that last slide? I think I was getting a little thumb happy. By our information on that last page, you can take a, a snapshot of that, photo of that, so you can call us if anything. I can't stress enough though, again, so I wanna get back to this too. Now, you figure we have 16 plus departments, divisions, departments, okay? Now, um, Allison said something earlier about you know your reputation and stuff like that. I always say, just make sure you know your capability and your capacity, all right? Just remember this. Now, when you roll into, um, when you arrive, when people arrive to Pensacola, they go to Pensacola International Airport, they're arriving by plane. And say, for instance, you're a landscaper, okay? And you're, you're, trying, to, you're trying to do a bid. The requirements for Pensacola Airport is totally different from the requirements at one of our recreation centers, all right? Know what you're getting into, all right? You, because you say to yourself, I understand, for me, I know you uh, people, you know, businesses wanna get a job. You wanna hurry up and especially get your foot in the door with the government. Be careful what you grab. Make sure you do your research Make sure you look at the job and, and step back and do a true assessment of what that job entail. Say to yourself, can I fulfill that contract, if I get it the way it's written? Can I give them the level of quality service that they're asking for? Because in each of our contracts, there's a, a, a clause I put up in there that we put in there. Termination for convenience. And, and that is for, just remember, we're being good stewards of taxpayers' money. Okay? If a person's messing up on a job for, you know, it's a, it, it might be a, a one-year contract. But one month you did good. Rest of the month you're just failing. Here we are, we, we're, we're trying to give you um, ways so we can correct the situation. You're not meeting that threshold, that standard. So you say, do we continue wasting taxpayers' money or do we cut our ends right now? That helps both of us. See what I'm saying? Now when that tie is cut, what happens next? What happens when the next person say, hey, because all persons and agencies talk, just like construction agencies talk. People within same occupation, you talk, right? Exactly. Your reputations follow you, all right? You don't want it to be a bad one. You want it to be positive. But when that, when that, um, partnership is severed, then other people talk and they say, well, he didn't do it because of, they didn't do it because, um, yeah, they just missing out on that and they missing out on this and they couldn't do that and it kept messing up on the same and the same um, problem, you know? So what do you do? That follows, right? So no matter what you do, just make sure you do it right, all right? Um, 
each department, again, they're able to go out and, 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 um, and go for bids or um, you're able to go for a bid for each department. Um, other thing I just wanted to say is put your name in, in as many hats as possible. You never know when you're going to get that opportunity. Vendor list gets you in the door so we know who you are. If an opportunity pops up in one of our departments, boom. SBE, that helps you out. All right, MWBE, I can't stress that enough. If you, if you meet the requirements for MWBE, get your name in the list. Get certified. Get your papers in order first before you move forward to get certified. But you want to get certified because you just never know whether it's with the city of Pensacola or whether some other agency look at that list and say, hey, um, we're looking for a minority-owned business or women-owned business in this area. Can you provide me a list? Or they can just go on our, on our directory and look you up. But you don't want to miss out, okay? So that's all I have. Thank you for your time and attention. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our organization and then I'm going to a presentation about some strategies uh, for business owners. Uh, they're based on uh, Porter's strategies. So um, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a consultant with the University of West Florida, uh, Florida SBDC program. Uh, the program itself has been around for about 45 years. It's actually a national program under the United States Small Business Administration. And uh, the pilot program started here uh, years ago. Um, it was a part of the eight initial programs that they started as a pilot. It was really successful. Um, we're partnered with the Higher Ed Education Institute. Uh, in this particular area, the University of West Florida is our host partner, so they support us. Um, and with the Florida SBDC, um, how many people have ever heard of our organization just by a show of hands? Okay, wonderful. Um, it's a great program, and the reason it's a, an excellent program is because, one, um, the program is a prepaid service program, so there's no direct cost to you. Uh, the business uh, fundamentals that we work on and workshops, all of that is no cost to you. Uh, so if, if you haven't connected with our organization, I'm going to go through a couple of things uh, as far as what we offer services with. And then I, I do encourage you to connect. Uh, it's very simple. You can just go onto our uh, website and request SBDC consulting. Um, and some of the things that uh, we work on is growth acceleration. Um, and you might wonder, what exactly does that mean, growth acceleration? Um, we really focus on our commitments. So our commitment is to utilize our knowledge, our experience, our resources to deliver services and products that meet our customer needs and contribute to their business success and growth. Um, it really is to advance our mission, which is to deliver and develop collaborative alliances that leverage organizational uh, strengths and produce lasting benefits in our community. So, when I joined uh, the SBDC, I've been in this role for about four years, I really wanted to make an impact um, in the community. I'm originally from the Pensacola area. I went to um, Pensacola High School. I graduated here, and then I also attended the University of West Florida, uh, where I did my master's in, uh, in business, and I also did uh, my undergrad uh, in corporate communication. And Again, our history really started back in the early 1940s. Uh, Congress uh, started a program to establish university-based extension services. And the United States Small Business Administration, they realized, um, and that point was kind of made clear earlier 
uh, this morning that about 99% of uh, the economy is actually supported by small businesses, individuals like yourself, whether that's a micro business uh, or if you're a, follow that uh, textbook definition of a small business where you have uh, 500 or less employees um, and your revenue, you don't generate more than $10 million. So really, in order to be a small business, is a very broad definition. So uh, if you feel that you have a, uh, an idea that you're looking to establish or a service that you want to provide to our community, uh, or if you're already a business owner and you're here in the area and you're looking for that growth acceleration, here are some of the uh, services that we actually uh, provide. So we're in nine regions in the state of Florida. There's about 45 offices. Um, and then we have like 50 outreach offices. The University of West Florida uh, area, our SBDC here, we cover the 10 counties from Escambia County over to Tallahassee. So if you're in one of those counties, you'd be reaching out to our office. Uh, we have offices in uh, here in Pensacola, in Fort Walton Beach, and also in Panama City. And then we work very closely with the chambers um, to provide support there uh, in Crestview, uh, if you're in the Milton area or if you're in uh, Fort Walton or Navarre, uh, we do usually collaborate with one of the chambers and work where we have uh, a weekly office there. Some of the things that you might not be aware about our organization, and I'm gonna kind of go through a few of those things, is that we really, um, you, or you might be interested to know where exactly do we assist. So we assist in marketing, so if you're in the stage of marketing where you're looking to see what type of strategy you're looking for, uh, if you're looking to kind of vet your idea and figure out what marketing plan best suits you, uh, we do that type of assistance. Uh, if you're looking to access capital, we do financial analysis just to see the health of your organization, if there's any inefficiencies where you could do better, um, or if there's actually um, particular segments in that market where you can grow. Uh, we also identify demographic areas that might be best suitable uh, for you to go into. So if you're, say for instance, um, you might offer a particular service like um, dog training, right? Uh, this area is actually really big on uh, pets. I have a pet um, and you're interested in training your dog. Um, you might not want to be in an area that's saturated. You want to go into the area that has less, uh, less of an established business there. So there's like more market shares for you to take over. So we would help you uh, actually identify target areas that you can go into. Um, because we're paired with the University of West Florida, we have access to quite a few um, databases and programs, everything from IBIS World uh, to Reference USA or Demographics Now. Um, and some of those programs you might be familiar with, um, they're programs that actually use the census data to kind of establish how the growth of that uh, community might be growing, who's, who's there, what type of businesses are established there. <clears throat> Some of the other things that we address is um, working with the federal government. That's why we're here today. Um, some of those programs, we have a PTAC specialist. Um, he focuses on the federal level, so we have uh, access to the bid server. So if there's a particular uh, North American industry code that you're interested in, in connecting with, those emails can be sent directly to you so you'll know when those opportunities are uh, being pursued. Uh, he also establishes, uh, we, we have a really good relationship with uh, the local community, so local municipals and also uh, local organizations like, like Escambia County, schools districts, uh, ECUA. We um, always try to support these and have a great relationship with them so that if ever you need to be introduced or kind of na uh, navigate or network with those types of uh, procurement offices, we want to support that as well. So if you, if you go onto our website, um, they'll, a, they'll actually ask you, are you looking for financial assistance? Are you looking for marketing sales or growth assistance, business strategy, uh, market research, or uh, internet marketing online? Uh, my particular uh, specialty, I'm a certified uh, consultant with when it comes to credit analysis. So my certification is doing financial analysis and really crunching the numbers uh, to see where do you spend most of your money? Is there any way that we can get more of that money to the bottom line? How's your cash flow? Uh, is it really strong? Uh, 
do you need more support there or what can you do to be a more efficient business? So, so those are some of the things that I look at, uh, usually based on metrics. Uh, so that's, I just let the numbers kind of do the, the talking. Uh, other things that we are um, really invested in is investing in black and brown founders. So there's an ecosystem here in the Northwest community that we really want to build out. Uh, if you're not aware of what, what that is, please you know, reach out to me. Um, I have quite a few things back there that you can, uh, you're welcome to take. Um, and they're just like overviews of what we offer uh, as far as the one-on-one -on -one consulting. Uh, but the, for the most part, um, Something that I feel is really important that everyone knows is that as a uh, business owner, as an entrepreneur, you can make 12 times the amount of money or income than just working as a, a laborer or cost hours. And, and the reason that is so uh, significant to me is because really closing the wealth gap, that's something that we've been really talking about in some of the uh, roundtable discussions that I'm a part of, but it's being an entrepreneur is the way uh, or the wave of the future to really drive growth in our community and bring back those jobs because uh, in, in fact, if you are the business owner, then you can hire more and black brown people to do the work and you can encourage them to go on and establish their own businesses. So definitely something that I'm interested in and if, if you're interested in that, please reach out. There are several programs here in our area that I really uh, hope that are supported. Uh, the Kankua Institute is one of those programs. They have a startup on the blocks. Uh, it's a networking program where uh, like-minded individuals and entrepreneurs get together kind of to share best practices, things that work, uh, and then also being familiar with those resources out there, uh, whether it's a procurement office, uh, whether it's a particular uh, banker or lender, or uh, anyone that has a, uh, a like mind to drive community development. Some other things that I'm going to uh, touch on today is a little bit about um, critical issues that face small businesses. A lot of times when you're, when you're getting started with an idea or you're already um, in the process of being an established business, something that comes up is the strategy. What type of strategy kind of like best works um, for your business? Um, you may be aware of this, but there's actually only a handful of strategies to use out there. And uh, in my presentation, I'm gonna go ahead and discuss that in greater detail. So I have someone here that's gonna be assisting me with the clicking. Oh, there he is, okay, perfect. So if we could go ahead and go to the uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, today, I'm gonna step back away from that a little bit. So today I'm gonna focus on Michael Porter's um, book that he actually established uh, these competitive uh, ways to reach your audiences and what those are. Um, if you can go ahead and click to the next slide. Some of the key points that we'll, we'll be looking at is what are those generic strategies and models? Um, there's three of them, three different options that you can select from. Uh, one's going to be cost leadership, one's going to be a differentiator, and then the other one is a focus. Um, a lot of times when organizations get started, they're like, who do I target? What's going to be the best strategy for me? Um, as far as the cost leadership strategy, um, just thinking about that in perspective, you're trying to offer a service or product um, and be most cost efficient with that. And what that means is that with your um, supply chain, you really have dialed in um, the individuals that you're using to get the most effective cost price so that whatever you're paying for is the most lowest price that you, that you can pay for it and therefore you can offer those savings and pass those savings savings on. Um, so this is a, um, a matrix for that. So if you look in the top, you have the differentiator, you have the cost leadership, then you have the cost focus, and then you have the differentiator focus. So the way it's set up, so if you're doing a competitive advantage, um, the scope can be narrow, it can be broad, uh, it can be based on cost, or it can be based on how different your service or product is. 
So with the, um, the scope on the broad spectrum, the cost leadership basically, um, you might think of companies like Walmart. So Walmart, that's the particular strategy that they use is cost leadership. They're actually seeking to secure uh, different packages from different vendors that will basically drive their costs down and then they're able to offer um, the uh, the least amount as far as like charging of an items, and that's because they are using that broad strategy. Um, as far as a differentiator, you might think of like Delta Airlines. I don't know if you've ever flown on Delta, but you can have a lot of souped up um, items. Is everything from your first class um, to if you have Wi-Fi access, uh, if you have in-flight movies, all those types of things um, they offer. And then they also have like the Delta Lounge that you can um, relax in. Um, those are all things that set them apart from other airline uh, carriers and basically um, with that differentiator model, they're allowed to charge a little bit more because they're offering you a specialty item or a specialty service. Now with the, the focus model, some of the things that you might think on the focus model uh, might be if you are a, um, a salon operator and perhaps you offer uh, hair coloring or hair dyeing, but you only do it with like natural products. So it's very specific. So not only are you in the um, hair and salon industry, but then you have narrowed it down to actually focus in on individuals that don't want to have chemicals used in their hair products. Um, next slide, please. So the way this breaks down for your first source, um, the competitive advantage can be a scope that's either broad or narrow, just going back to that. Um, the cost focus or the differentiator focus and the leadership of differentiator, both of those can be a narrow. Next slide, please. And again, this is just broke down where you can see the scope can be broad or narrow, so you can focus in on the cost or you can focus in on being a differentiator in that niche. Next slide. Some of the things that um, for these strategies that you might think about, well, how do I know um, what type of strategy should I use? So Porter actually in his book, uh, he specifically brought into uh, a SWOT analysis and also um, the five forces. So the SWOT analysis, you can actually use that to identify your strength, your weaknesses, the threats and opportunities that you have for your business. And once you define what those opportunities are, then from there you can see, okay, would I be uh, best suited to go into a focused marketing or would I be best focused to do a narrow or maybe even a broad strategy? Next slide, please. So some of the things that um, with the broad, the cost leadership and the differentiator, um, most of those um, items that you look at with the SWOT analysis, you can do that not only with the operation of the business overall, but maybe you might even wanna do it with a product. So say for instance, you have a product out there, you can take that product and really break down, okay, what is the strength of this product? What is the weakness of the product? Is there a particular threat to this product or a substitute for that product that might reduce the access or um, ability to really capitalize on those segments uh, and the market shares that you have there. Next slide, please. So some of the things that um, you might be interesting, there's like a step-by-step -step process and I'm gonna go ahead and go into that briefly. Um, so with the cost leadership, uh, if your aim is to uh, really be competitive, you might want to improve the efficiency and leverage your economy of scales. Um, and that's just lowering your production costs or fearing um, what the standard of that component might be. Um, it's a high utilization when you do the economy of scales. Uh, some of the times that might just be maximizing the use of the service in a certain period of time. Next slide, please. And then also, um, a lot of these things require research, and that's kind of like where the SPDC goes in. Uh, market research can be vital. Uh, if you don't know what your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, or threats are, we can assist you with developing that. Uh, some of the things that um, come to mind is the ability to really see um, 
If you can have a quick turnaround, having more customers to stay in a shorter period of time, or even um, occupying hours at that time, which basically allow you to utilize whatever resources or overhead you have uh, more efficiently. Next slide, please. So with a narrow focus, um, some of the things um, that you might be able to do to kind of um, really uh, focus in on those narrow uh, focuses is having a roundtable discussion or doing surveys to really figure out what is it the customer want. Um, in, in the case with Delta, that particular case study, they went out and they started surveying any individual that rode or uh, booked with them. Um, and then they were able to identify what additional things that they wanted. Some of the things that they came back with, individuals don't want the uh, middle seat taken, or they wanted to be able to you know, do work as they were traveling. Um, or if um, you know, they had a layover, the, um, they wanted to be able to take a quick nap in the safety of the airport, and that's where they developed all these differentiating models or focus models. Next slide, please. So um, with the achieving um, low cost uh, may be from paying uh, lower wages or warehouses in lower rented areas or minimizing advertisement. Those are all things that you could look at. So currently, what are you operating at? Um, how much are you investing in advertisement? How much time are you investing in um, where you're at as far as like what you're paying for rent or mortgage, can any of that be lessened to make you more efficient? The strategy starts at the top, but then working up to that is really done through the um, SWOT analysis, whether that's a product or whether that's the operational, um, operational activities of that business, you can clearly see what you're doing effectively and what you're not doing effectively. Next slide, please. So here we are, um, some key takeaways just from the actual Porter forces. Um, the five forces, um, I hadn't actually gotten into that as of yet, but that talks about um, your supplier, that talks about um, your buyer, that talks about the environment that you're living in, is it competitive, are there other people trying to uh, compete for those resources? Um, typically, good research is how you get to the bottom of that, and then basically strategizing and planning in the process of, okay, this is something that we do really well and effectively, and then we could use this and leverage this to our advantage. Next slide, please. Um, the SWOT analysis, again, this is going to be um, just going into depth about your strengths, your weaknesses, what you're doing extremely well, um, and where there's opportunity to grow. Um, I can't go into a lot of details specifically about this because every industry, every business is quite different. Um, these are just like general practices. So when you start doing your marketing, you really have to take a uh, self-examining eye about what you're doing as a business owner. Um, you know, what is it that you do extremely well, and then what exactly is it that you can leverage to bring more people into that solution that you're providing? Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a visual of what that SWOT analysis looks like, some of the questions and things that you might consider, um, the quality of, of that strength, is it a tangible or intangible quality, um, weaknesses, things that your company could improve in or a competitor may be doing a little bit better than you, and then those opportunities really could be an opportunity to expand with a particular product that you already have, or it could be going to another product segment where you actually um, are offering like a, a, a um, spin-off product of something that you're already doing. Threats, however, um, this can get into the rim of like, say for instance, uh, with COVID, um, when this occurred, a lot of businesses weren't doing face-to-face -face businesses. Everything went to online. And when that happened, um, being able to actually get up and standing a operation where you could be online, what we did in, in our particular um, 
organization, we went to um, virtual meetings and then also one-on-one -on -one conference calling. So we're still able to offer that um, consulting service, but it was done a little bit th differently. And some of the other threats people might have experienced is just com complete closure to the outside world um, where you weren't able to offer those services and basically being able to recognize, okay, if this happens, how can I mitigate that risk? Next slide, please. This is a visual on the porters, um, basically talking about are there other people entering into this industry? Um, what's your relationship with your buyers and your suppliers? And then also uh, being aware of any threats that may come up as a substitute of that product. Um, a substitute you might think about, um, say for instance, bread. Okay, um, bread might have a substance, a substitute of you know tortillas are also uh, in the same. Uh, family of that, uh, maybe even um, low, low grain items, and those could be like the healthier wraps. Those are all substitutes for bread, not necessarily bread. So you might not think, okay, what can compete with bread? There's a lot of other things. And then sometimes it might just be um, things where people just have boneless items. So those are all would be a substitute item. And uh, basically thinking about what is it that I offer that someone else could go with that could potentially replace what I'm offering, being aware of that, or at least knowing that's on the horizon, that I am not only just competing with individuals that are bread makers, but I'm also competing with other individuals that offer those substitute for bread items. Next slide, please. So um, my presentation kind of went kind of quickly because I talked pretty fast through that. Um, but one of the things that I, I really wanted to just kind of wrap up with is the strategies out there. Um, there's only three. So when you are a business owner, start thinking about that. Am I, am I going to try to be a cost leadership? Am I going to be a differentiator? Or am I going to be a focus strategy? Now, if you... Um, are still assessing which of those three strategies kind of work best for you, really go back to um, considering what is it that you do very well, where's an opportunity, where there's a threat of um, potentially something that you're not doing as well or inefficiently. And then also considering your environment. Um, so the porter kind of talks about the external environment that you operate in, whereas the SWOT analysis can not only be used internally, but it also can be used to assess, assess um, externally as well. Some other things that um, you may or not, you may be aware of the uh, five forces just to talk in, in, in a little bit in depth of how you actually understand your competitiveness competitiveness as a business um, is your environment is when you go to do the SWOT analysis or the five, order, five, uh, five forces of the porter, you really want to think about um, can you reduce or manage your supplier power? Can you reduce or manage your buyer power? Can you reduce or eliminate any threats to substitution? And really thinking about are there other individuals that are going to come into the industry and maybe offer a similar service or something very similar that uh, would be a, a compete for that market share? Um, an, an entrepreneur would really want to mirror himself in the best way possible. So when you think of your competitors out there, what are they offering, what are they doing, you're actually uh, assessing how are you measuring up to them? Are there things that they're doing that you like? Are there things that they're doing that are inefficiently? Um, and basically, you can learn a lot just by assessing what competitors are doing. And that's why it's important to you know, really buy into an ecosystem. Um, that ecosystem, what's happening in our community, is a way for you to really visually see, um, is my company holding up internally and externally to what other others are doing, peers in my industry are currently in what level they're operating at. And then lastly, if you're um, interested in finding out more about Porter's strategies or in uh, really doing a, an analysis of your own company or where you're operating at and where you can be more efficient, um, I've just put here briefly that uh, we have uh, online training and we do in-person training and then we do um, 
a lot of our out, um, outgoing outreach and stuff like that is listed on our Facebook, uh, as well as our newsletter that we provide to those who, who are uh, registered with um, the SBDC. I also provide uh, weekly office hours. They're on Wednesday um, from nine to noon. And the only thing you have to do is just email me, let me know that you have a question, and then uh, we can get online or you can meet me at the office and we can kind of talk about what that issue you might be having. I wasn't told that if we could have questions at this particular time, are we allowed to have questions? Okay, perfect. Are there any questions out there from the audience that you might have over some of the strategies or just connecting further? Okay, it's afternoon time. People are probably ready for lunch. Yes. Sure. Um, because we offer um, confidential uh, services, we're not allowed to, you know, really get into depth about our, uh, our clients that we have. But something that's been um, really successful for me is um, I've worked with a, a number of clients, but the, the most recent uh, testimonial that I received is from uh, Total Dog. So they provided me with the testimonial so I can talk about that freely. Um, they were a, um, a small business owner. They had not been in business before, and they started offering dog training in the Destin area. Um, they've now expanded their services also to the Atlanta, Georgia area, and they've offered um, multiple uh, services from Pensacola, Fort Walton Beach, and also Destin. So they were able to expand. Um, currently, right now, we're in the process. They're actually getting a new location where they have a brick and mortar um, area. So they're not only doing dog training, but they've actually extended from that. So they're now able to offer uh, boarding services, grooming, and then daycare, um, those types of things. Um, other things that have gone really well with some of the clients that I work with as far as testimonials um, is um, Alpha Closet. They are a local um, company here that provides custom closets. Um, I was able to work with them and they were able to uh, get an SBA loan to further grow and accelerate their business. Absolutely. Any other questions out there? Yes, sir. Uh, very quickly, uh, our, this is a general question. Is the SBDC doing in-person lunch and learns or, or trainings like that? We had done a pause on that. Um, starting July 1st, the um, university is lifting those restrictions. So we'll start back to in-person meeting and also having uh, workshops. Um, for a while there, we just had a pause on that just because of safety issues. And uh, But July, we'll be back full on. And we'll have, if you go to our website at SBDU, or SBDC, uwf.edu, they have our trainings listed. And then they also have like upcoming events and how you could um, really participate in those lunch and learns and different programs. We do have our uh, next, next level program. Uh, it's actually a nine month program for established businesses and they meet like once a month on the third or fourth uh, Thursday of the month and it actually works on different business goals that you decide and dictate how you want your business to grow. Hi, my question is, do you also work with nonprofits? Yes, so we, we are allowed to work with nonprofits. Um, primarily, we work with small and medium enterprises that are established. Um, that is 70% of what we do. 30% is working with entrepreneurs. Um, but we do work with nonprofits. Um, the Kakua Institute, their nonprofit that we work with. Um, we also work with like the Northwest Florida Fire Department. They're uh, a nonprofit that we work with. So yes. We had another question up here up front. I, I did see your hand. Yes. It's actually currently going on now. They have a cohort that they're working with. Um, follow up with us. The new, the new um, program will probably be established in like September. Once that one wraps up, then they'll start being taking intake for the, for the new program. Do you know what the hours are for that program? So, 
it's not an online program. They've been meeting at the, um, um, over at the, uh, the collab. They have the social, uh, the social collab. It's over there off of Pace, so they've been meeting in person for that particular one. Um, but as I said, in September, that one should wind down, and then they'll start taking applications for the new one. Yes, sir. I was told this is the last question. Me? I'm sorry. Okay. No, I just was wondering, because you answered the question about the nonprofit, but they were existing. If someone wanted to start a nonprofit organization, um, are there resources available through your organization for that? Yes, if that nonprofit is looking for assistance on business development planning or just basically accessing capital to stand that up, if you're talking about actually writing the, um, no, okay. So just like the business planning part, yes, that's business fundamentals. That's exactly what we do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate your participation. Uh, if you have any questions, please visit my booth back there. Um, you're welcome to talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. And again, a lot of this is just broad information, but specifically if there's something that you wanna focus on or a goal that you wanna reach, uh, please let us know. We have 20 different uh, certified consultants in the office. Um, you may be working with me, you may be working with another consultant, but the point is um, if you have a dream or if you have a business, do use these services. They're prepaid services. For the, for the taxpayers. Thank you very much, Ms. McCaskill. What we're going to do now, guys, we're going to break for lunch, but if, unless you guys object, let's make lunch a half an hour so we can get back in instead of going a full hour, get back in and wrap it up. We've got a couple other people that are going to speak very, very briefly. Lunch is going to, we've got two tr food trucks that are outside the double doors right here where the exercise are to my media right. And we'll open those up and let's go to lunch. Let's try to, again, make it 30 minutes so we can get back in and wrap it up. Love your participation. It's been a long day, but I think a lot of knowledge has been shared. But I want to kind of wrap it up so you guys, your business folks, so you still got stuff to do when you leave here. I know that. Thank you. The business certification. It's somewhat of a process, but we have the expert, the director, the executive director of the Office of Surprise Diversity, Mr. Bruce Roberts, is going to come up and give a presentation. But this, this is critical, guys. The city or the state, I'm sorry, the city or the county, we don't have a minority business program, but the state does. And getting certification opens up a lot of doors for you. And I think, you know, take this piece very, very seriously. I know you guys are wrapping up and ready to go, but this is, this is really the meat and the potatoes of this and a couple of the other pieces. So without any further ado, I bring up Mr. Bruce Roberts, the executive director of the Office of Supply Diversity. And he came all the way from Tallahassee to do this, so I thank him a whole lot. Bruce. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. Good afternoon, everyone. Whew. Everybody's full. Great, great presenters before me. Thank you uh, for everyone that's been out here. Um, I'm going to do little things differently. I'm not a podium person, so I don't like podiums. <clears throat> that's just me, right? So I like to walk around. I like to talk. I like to engage you. And we're going to do something different. Right, does everyone in here know everyone? No? So if you don't mind, if you're, I know I'm vaccinated, but if you don't mind, go and meet, go and shake someone's hand and say, hey, how are you doing? Just somebody you do not know. And there's a reason why I'm doing this. So get up, go around somebody and someone that you do not know and say hello. Oh, you see the socks? Oh, yeah. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Very long. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you as well. Good, good. All right. 30 more seconds. 30 more seconds.
All right. Ooh, I like that. You see what I just saw? Yes, sir. I like that. Good job. Great job. So I got a question. What do we just do? Ooh, say it again. What do we do? We network. We network. So what does Office Supply Diversity does? So my name is Bruce Roberts. I am the Executive Director over Office Supply Diversity at Department of Management Services. So our team's job there is to get woman-owned, veteran, and minority vendors certified, small business. So Jose talked about it earlier. He said less than 50 employees. Um, they have less than a million, but our state certification says um, less than five million. So there's your difference. And so we've had a lot of people come up to us and say, you got Pensacola's you know, requirements, you have the state requirements. Hey, if you're here in Pensacola and you do not want to travel and all type of stuff, make sure you deal and talk to P Pensacola's um, requirements. But we can help you out and get state certified as well. So I want to sum up OSD. We connect, engage, and grow women, minority, and veteran-owned businesses in the state of Florida. I'm saying that for you one more time. We connect, we engage, and we grow women, minority, and veteran-owned women, or veteran-owned businesses in the state of Florida. That is our job. So that little activity we just did, I seen people shaking hands, saying hello, Within the last 30 seconds, what did I see? Business cards being exchanged, information being exchanged. Why? Because you're connecting. What did I say the first thing we, we, that we do? Connect. Oh, I'm engaging, so you gotta engage with me. So what is the first thing we just did? We connect, right? We engage, and then we're gonna grow our business in the state of Florida. We have an agenda, what we do. Grow your business, benefits of being certified, we have doing business with the state of Florida and give you as many resources as possible. If you have not been to our table, and I think mostly you have, get as much information as you can. Get my business card, we can talk, we have conversations. We have a team that can do everything for you. That's what we do. Next slide, so I'm gonna not play with that. So yes, can we get the next slide? Can you play that for me? It's a video on our website. If you go to our website, literally, myflorida.com. So it's dms.myflorida.com. So DMS is in Delta Mike Sierra dot myflorida.com slash OSD as October Sierra Delta. There's a video on there regarding how you can start doing business that's getting my photo marketplace, that's getting your UNSPSC codes. So the state deals with a eight digit code, United Nations Standard Products and Service Codes. And so that's how we, you recognize what do you do. So my question is, ma'am, so I told you I'm engaging, right? So what is your name? Lakeisha. Lakeisha's in the house. Everyone say, hey Lakeisha. Hey, Lakeisha. Woo -woo. What is your business? Uh, Gulf Coast Panorama Photography. So you do photography. So awesome. So when she goes into my photo marketplace, and we call it our photo vendor information portal, or VIP, what she would do is she would actually select her UNSPSC code to identify what she actually does as a photographer. So when someone goes out and says, we need business for a photographer, we can actually identify her code. And what most agencies do, they actually send us their bids and say, hey, we need this OSD. And then what OSD team does is we say, hey, vendor with that particular code, here's an opportunity. Please note, OSD, please, I don't want y'all leaving here saying Bruce said he can, give, he can get us business. I did not say that. I did not say that. What I said is I can give you opportunities, right? So if they give us the information, we pass the information on. And we said, here's an opportunity. Now I'm gonna throw uh, SBDC in here. Where y'all at? Where's APC? Woohoo! She's raising her hands behind there, right? And so, say you're a vendor 
and you've never submitted a bid response to a state agency, how can we support you? Well, we don't do that for you because we can't be biased and say, okay, look, we, we, we can't write your proposal for you. But what we can do is say, hey, get with SBDC. They have recruiters that can help you do your proposal with you, and they'll help you submit it. And so that's how we, what the first thing we do? Come on now, what the first thing we do? And then what? And then what? What did I just do with her business? In a way that I cannot get in trouble. Remember, I'm a state employee, so I can't promote her business. So what I did was she asked, hey, I have a business. She has a code. She's already signed up. But I cannot help her do her business. But what I can do is pass her on to someone, a direct connection engagement that allowed her to get her business growing. That's what we do. So since 2020, March of 2020, what happened in March of 2020? Come on, what happened? COVID, a, pandem a health pandemic happened for the, for the United States, for the world, right? But guess what? DMS, state agencies, did not stop working. We worked for you. How do we work for you? We still had, and remember, this is only directed to minority vendors. This time you're talking about all the other $3 billion that the state of Florida has spent, other, other agencies. Just 1,500 plus vendors were certified. And out of that minority pool, over 600 million was given to minorities. 600 million. You can't tell me that our office does not engage with minority suppliers. We make sure that you are connected and you have an opportunity to, re to put in a bid to get the job. Next slide, please. We had an increase of almost 30%. So what can OSD to go do for you? Connect, engage, and grow our minority population businesses in the state of Florida. That's what we can do. Women, 612, just in that alone. Veterans, 783. I do want to stop here and say I am a veteran, but I also want to thank every veteran that is actually here. So thank you for your service for all the veterans that are here. And even though my mama, I thank you mama for being awesome and raise a young, wonderful man like myself, um, but women on as well. But African American, right? We have Asian American, Hispanic American. So I want to break down real quick. So we say we only have three designations. So we have woman, minority, and then veteran, right? But in that minority, you can become an African-American woman-owned veteran business. So you hit all three designations. You can be a minority, you can be a veteran, and you can be a woman-owned. You can do that. Now, for him, he can. Why, why can't he be all three? Oh, because he's, oh, y'all can say it. Because he's a man, so he can't be a woman-owned business, right? But he can, he can be veteran and African-American or Hispanic. You may feel like one, okay. <laughs> nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Actually, we've had that question before. I'm so glad you said that. Someone actually called and says, do you certify the LGBT, LGD, LGBTQ plus community? Statute does not verify that. It just says woman owned, veteran, minority. So we do not just say, but that's a good question. But that's good though, I think that. And so Native American. So we can just move forward with it. All right, next slide, please. Look at our population. We have 8% in the Northwest. Everybody's here mostly is from Panama City, right? Pens or did I say Panama City? Pensacola. I like Destin, Florida, so my bad. So Pensacola, right? Most of y'all from Pensacola. Let's get that number up. 8%. And it's just a breakdown of where our certified businesses are throughout the state of Florida. I hear somebody say, whoa. Yeah, so you, you can call, an, aren't you gonna call our office? You can call our office like, can I get certified? We want you to. Next slide, please. This is what we do. So um, Brian, does everybody know Brian, our Chamber of Commerce? Woohoo, he's over there. 
So we're actually partnering with them September 21st to put on what we call a OSD exchange. You've, some of you have probably heard of it before. It used to be called OSD um, Matchmaker. But I can't, you can't, I can't make you, you know, it's like the love thing, Matchmaker. I can't do that. So it's all about matching or exchange, having an exchange. And so we bring in multiple vendor, uh, agencies and you actually get to have a one-on-one -on -one with those agencies. It's almost like, and you get to have your time slots. We'll send out um, uh, flyers. We'll give it all to the um, Mr. Brian and his group, and they'll actually send it out to Pensacola. And so this is just a few of what we've done. Orlando, Broward, Tampa, next slide. Tallahassee, Pensacola, Gainesville. We've done all these. And we support everyone. Yeah, take a picture. We are there. We are there engaging. So it's almost like these tables are then put around. And so each agency, DOT, DOH, um, Elder Affairs, all these people can get together and say, okay, I want a time slot. And you have a time slot with each agency. And you can do in particular your job. I had someone come up to me earlier and say she does blind services. Well, maybe she doesn't need to get with a particular agency, or maybe she doesn't need to get with one, or maybe she needs to get with all. You never, you never know. And I think another one came to me earlier. Um, Daniel, do you remember which, I, I, besides the blind one, do you remember the other one? We've had a bunch. Uh, thank you. Um, but say I did uh, security, right? Well, does each agency need security? Probably so. You should say yes. Um, but may not every agency need security, but DOT, some things like that may need it, right? And so we're gonna get you connected. Remember, I said those words connect, connect to the right agency. That's what we wanna do. Yes. Where Jose at? Yeah. I th <laughs> yes, Jose is definitely, he was up here, he presented earlier with the Pensacola. Yes, he is huge with plenty of that. So you get information from him coming out to, to the county. Next slide. Contract opportunities, networking opportunities, and business development. Contracts opportunities. Once again, what do we do for you? We connect you to get contracts. We connect you for the opportunity to actually have a bid. That's what we do. So now, each county may be different, but we post our solicitations to state on what we call VBS. I know it's summer. I know y'all used to probably saying vacation Bible school. <laughs> it's not vacation Bible school. Sorry, I know, thank you, Jesus. Um, but it's not vacation Bible school, but it's called our Florida Vendor Bid System. It's where we place all our solicitations for the state of Florida. Now, some counties actually use our system. It allows you to actually go in there and see bids. But once again, what does OSD do for you? Maybe you don't have an individual that can actually go on a VBS and always look at bids for you, for your company. What do we do? If you have a commodity code that's associated with, us, with that solicitation, we send that bid to you and say, hey, here's an opportunity. So once again, if you have not been certified and do not have the right hand beside you, you would like for us to be that right hand for you. We connect with everyone. I'm telling you right now, DMS connects with everyone. We go, we do exchanges in Pensacola, we do exchanges in Miami, we do exchanges everywhere, Tampa, Orlando, USF, UCF, uh, Fort Lauderdale, we do them everywhere. And I think we're gonna try to do one in Jacksonville this year as well. So please, please connect, connect, connect. Next slide, just a few reference, our online directory, and don't worry, if you actually get our material and contact us, we can bring you all this information. So we have our reference online directory, that's actually where, just say Pensacola, says I would like a vendor that is certified to do construction. They can actually go in our online directory, search the commodity code in the county and it'll pull up all the vendors that's listed that's certified in that county. Wouldn't you want to be part of those vendors that's selected? I should see I should be seeing heads like I told you I'm very engaging. It's like so you should you should want to be one of those vendors that they select. So that's what they do. Targeted communications. I've always said that we've target 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 not target copy. 
not the other target, but we target you all for communications. Networking opportunities. How do we network? It's right here. Exchanges. This is what we do for you all. And we also have guidance. We guide you all. We can give you the right people. And I'm always use this word, connect. We always connect. I'm give you an action example. Um, the couple's already gone, and I think uh, Brian was going to speak on it, but I did my very first a webinar for OSD uh, back in March. And, and I was actually down in Miami at the federal vaccination site at the Broward Community College. And I was doing TV events and everything like that, and I got called up. Um, actually, my boss back there, raise your hand. Yep, yep. He called me and they was like, the governor needs your resume. I was like, what in the world? I don't, why does the, why does downtown, I stay downtown, but the governor's office need my resume. Look, got my resume. And the next thing you know, I was told to come back up to Tallahassee. You've been promoted to executive director over OSD. Thank you very much. But down there, I'm going to tell you why that's so important, because I got the title, and then I left two days later. Two days later, I left to go back down and do a federal site. While I was down there, a, comp a, a woman asked a question. She's like, I have a consulting company. How do I do business with the state of Florida? And I was so proud to say, oh, my team can do it for you. <laughs> My team can get you certified. We can do that for you. And that's what we did. We got her certified. And literally, in less than a month, we didn't give her a business. She just, had an, she just needed an opportunity. In less than a month, she was able to get a state term contract with Broward County. Two weeks later, doing a webinar, a couple that came from Jacksonville that was here earlier today, she said she's been having trouble getting certified. She saw my webinar. She contacted and she would say she was certified in less than five days. Now, I don't know if that's my bad for my staff, but the fact is, like, she was able to get connected quick. That's what our office does. Another guy, he was actually retired Army. Then he was also retired police chief down in Fort Lauderdale. He wanted to start a security company. I told him, did you meet the requirements to, be, to get your business? He said, no, he did everything because I've done it for like six weeks. He did it what he was supposed to do. Next thing you know, he was certified. What happened two weeks later? He called me when I was back up here in Tallahassee. Hey, just let you know, I just got the contract for the Broward County Security Company. Because he had already worked there, he just needed an opportunity. Our job is connect you, engage you, and grow the small minority businesses in the state of Florida. That's what we do. Those just are few stories I have that since I just, that's March. I know Daniel and our team has many more, but that's just March for me. Next slide. These are our steps to get certified. If you, yeah, I see pictures being taken out. You can also, we have brochures over there that you can actually get as well. 15 days. Now that 15 days, if you submit the proper documentation, so you can't say, oh, I submitted on Friday, and I should be certified 10 days later, because that's, you know, that's the 14 days, and I should be 15. No, that's 15 days, business days, it's Monday through Friday, and we must have all proper documentations to make sure that you're certified, right? If certified, a uh, certificate will be emailed to you. Somebody was actually here today as well. Are they still here? They said they were, here they are, raise your hand. That's what I'm talking about. And she's a veteran, so thank you as well. They just received it in the mail. So happy they received it. And they, what, the question they had was, can anybody guess what the next question was? What do you think the next question was? How do I get a contract? Ooh, what's next? That's what they said, what is next? And we started connecting them to people would say, what's next? All righty, and then your certification does last for two years. I will tell you this, after you get certified, there's a notification that will go out 90, 60, 30, 14 days, and seven days to let you know that it's time for to recertify. Good thing about Florida and our certification process, you don't have to do all the paperwork again, 
But if you let your certification lapse, you would do have to do the paperwork all over again. So please look at your email, check it out. Next slide. And I'm almost done. See, I cut it down. It was a 45 minute slide, but I cut it because we we're, we we're doing a lot. So contact information is there for you to have. Um, phone number is there, email address is there. Anything that you need, we'll be here afterwards. If you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you for attending um, here today and we appreciate you. Um, that's what OSD can do for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bruce. I do have one issue, though. I want you to know that the term matchmaker was the first. Myself and my former boss, I'm the former deputy director of the Office of Supplier Diversity a number of years ago. I'm not going to tell you how long. That'll tell my age. But uh, I want you to know we came up with the term matchmaker because we were trying to match businesses. So I, I take a little issue with that when you. <laughs> <laughs> but but thank you. Uh, I'm going to bring up the last person. And I, thank you guys for your patience. But I feel there's been a wealth of information that, that I wanted to get out to you guys. And I'm sorry for taking up almost your whole Saturday. But I think it's worth, worth it. But one of the most important people in this market right now is Mr. Brian Wire. He's the president of the Minority Business Chamber. And he's going to come up and ask, do a question and answer session with you guys. But he is a wealth of knowledge. Take advantage of it. And I'll, I'm going to do some closing remarks once he's done, but I'm going to be very, very brief. But thank you all for your patience. Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. I appreciate it. First of all, de depending on um, how many questions we have, is there any questions anyone has in the audience today? Let's see. I know it's been a long day. And I'll be honest with you, my head's ready to explode. There's so much information being given. But you know what the key is? Today you make connections. You saw the people to go to when you need that help and assistance. And I hate to follow Bruce, because Bruce was so dynamic. I tell you, he's a powerhouse. I'm like, wow, I didn't know he was that good. I would have been there before him. But um, let me tell you a quick key. The number 35 is kind of important today. I always count when I make connections of who have asked me a question and who I send them to. Today, there was 35 people that had a question, didn't know where to go. I referred them to a different person. I referred them to a different group and it made a difference because th the connections were there. I also kind of counted up for the year, and I said, I'm sorry, 35 boards, commissions, committees within the community. And that number seems really high. And people say, how do you remember to do all those things? The key is I have connections. I know where to go when I need help. If there's a city question, and I know the answer, I go to Hosea. If there's a county question, I send them to, to Jeffrey or others. If there's an SCBD question, I send them to Bree. If there's any other questions, I go to SCI and they'll take care of them. Wave your hand, Gracie, over there. So the key is not knowing all the answers, but knowing what people are part of your connections to make and knowing what questions to ask. I get asked to join a lot of boards and activities around, around the community. And when I join them, I say, look, there's a couple of things you need to know about me. Number one, I'm going to ask a lot of questions because I signed in my name saying this is part of the things I'm responsible for. So please understand, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. Uh, I don't need all the answers, but I want you to know that that's putting down the minutes as far as the answers being asked. And then at times, you know, I'm going to pull things back and slow them down when I need to. And two things I brought up on stage here today is my scissors. Because we do grand opening ribbon cuttings a lot. I just love a big pair of scissors. So if you join the chamber, one of the things you'll do is ribbon cuttings and grand opens. I just love the scissors to be able to cut them. And then my sign over here. When I first started the chamber about two and a half years ago, the new chamber, the Gulf Coast Minority Chamber, I put out this sign. And we took pictures for it and saying, I love diverse cities. This was before the big push for diversity and inclusion and equity, the whole DEI thing. And diversity was what we had pushed then because I realized I wanted to make our community diverse. But you know what? We're not quite equal yet, and we're not quite inclus inclusive. But the first step is being diverse. And today, we have diverse businesses here. We have diverse earth agencies here. But we're all leading towards one common goal, to get work involved with our local agencies and to get help for your business to survive. If you can get a government contract, 
or a contract with the school district with guaranteed money, that's amazing. They're not gonna just you know, take a check and bounce your check on you. So if you get those contracts, guys, that's the best, most secure way to get money for your business. You can survive on doing those, those items alone without having to do any other marketing and reaching to all the area areas by just working with the local governments. People have been so successful. So I encourage you, look at all the resources that you have out there. Imagine this being a circle. First, tackling the circle of Pensacola, then tackling the circle of Escambia, then tackling the circle of our region, and then tackling the circle of our state. Those are the ways you branch things out. But you know what the fun part is? You can reverse that. You can go to the state first with Bruce, get certified there, and that certification flows down. It helps you with the county, the city, and all your other areas. So you can go either way. But the key is to do the work to get certified. And I will tell you, at times it's not easy to do all the paperwork. I can't tell you how many businesses that came to me and, and Paul Nobles tell you as a former purchasing director with the county, they went through the process and say, you know what? I don't want the government nor my business. I don't know who I am. I don't want to share my information with them. I'm not going to do it. Those people miss out. If you have a good business in place, don't be ashamed of it. Share your stuff. If you don't have a good business in place and you have some things you're worried about, find the help to get it fixed because then you can be proud of your business. If you're ashamed of something on your books, don't just let that go by. Find people to help you get those things fixed and you'll feel so much better, guys. So my key today is for Q&A is that if you have questions, go find the answers. If you don't know where to find the answers, feel free to come to me and I'll try to point you in the right direction or I'll research it for you. The connections that we have today in this room are amazing. And I do want to thank a few folks in the room because I just have to. They're the folks behind the scenes that you don't see. They won't get up on, on this stage at times, but the way you work so hard. Tamika over there with all the food earlier that she was putting together was wonderful. I asked her was that her primary job role, and she said no, but when they call me, I'll get it done. Clara over here in her group, amazing behind the scenes. I got a chance to know her very well. We met with some long county meetings, me and Clara, and I got a chance to know her. Laura Cole over here, who, who's, she's in PR and public relations communications, but she's very shy about being publicly acknowledged, but I do want to let everyone, in fact, stand up, Laura, stand up to embarrass, no, Laura, you, stand up, Laura, embarrass, embarrass you even more. So, all the public relations, the planning and stuff, she helped to do it behind the scenes. You'll never know who she is. She stands on the other side of the camera, but she's an excellent person to know. Mr. Leroy Williams back here, facilities. All these tables, there wasn't any gremlins or pixies that came and put the tables together. <laughs> Mr. Leroy was here yesterday at 1.30, starting early, sending the one group of kids out of here, pulling them in, getting all these tables and logistics in place. And no one may never know his name, but he does work so hard with that. And I could thank folks all around this room. Mr. Wesley Hall, you know, he did the brainchild behind this whole entire thing. People call me the organizer, but really, I kind of jumped in and got some PR done and pushed information, but Mr. Wesley Hall was a brainchild behind doing this. In this process today, in this expo, trust me, there were so many moving pieces to it you would not imagine. In fact, right now, we have six different events going on around town that Commissioner May and a lot of us in this room probably should be at too, and you could be at, but you took time and energy to help to educate yourself, to self-learn, so give yourself a, hand, a round of applause for yourself. But this is the only way to approve. And I, I would be remiss if I don't thank the SEI folks, Gracie's over there, uh, DC Reeves, uh, Rachel earlier. SEI is a phenomenal supporter of minority businesses and items. And I will be, I almost shed a tear in the fact that Quint stood to help to make our chamber happen. If it wasn't for Quint three years ago when I took over the other chamber and created a new chamber, I don't know if we'll be around. And since that time period, I built relationships with Gracie, built relationships with DC and Rachel. They are truly public servants of people that are here for our community to help out minority and small business. They believe it, they walk the talk. So uh, there's supposed to be Q&A, and I'm sorry for not doing Q&A and talking instead, but it's important for you guys to know, if you do have a question, seek out the answer. And uh, personally, during COVID, I've been overrun at times, so some of you in the room that said, Brian, I sent you an email, but you didn't get respond to me, I do apologize, I'm trying my best. <laughs> I really am, because I, I found myself getting more overwhelmed than I need to be, so I apologize for that. 
And I do have some of my members in the chamber that's here that was earlier. Sabrina Simpson, Sabrina over here, with SOS. And uh, Sean throwing out members of our chamber and lots of others. I'm looking around the room. But Sabrina, I met Sabrina first at a networking event we had. We got together. We found, got her newspaper article and a story about her story of her and her, her lovely husband with her business. Front page, a uh, back page of a newspaper, and it blew up from there. People said, oh my gosh, you do this? They saw a minority businesswoman, powerful like Sabrina out there, and her husband, and they were just so impressed by that. And her business is, I can't tell you how successful her business is, but it started out by making a connection, coming to a networking event, not being shy, and asking a lot of questions. I think me and Sabrina spent an hour and a half together formalizing questions to ask. I didn't have all the answers. I didn't tell her that. But I did tell her I know where to find the answers to it, and it's amazing what she's done. So please, guys, use the people in this room. If somebody's doing the same thing you're doing, work with them. If you're the giver of the knowledge, be gracious. If you're the taker, get that knowledge and thank them for it. But uh, that's really it for today with Q&A. Like I said, we have a big event planned with Bruce, September the 21st. That will be the Office of Plurality and Diversity event that we're having. Will be the first in-person event in the entire state happening. We hope to get some people very high in the government agencies, the governor or, or around that level, a little bit below that, to be there. And we want to show what people at Pensacola can do. These past few years, when we had Office of Supply Diversity event, Pensacola, with my statistics and my metrics I created, Pensacola was, was one of the most successful ones above Miami, Tallahassee, Orlando, Gainesville, because we said these people are going to be there, and almost 99% of them showed up. And when they rated it, our survey rankings were in the high 90s above all those other big cities that we see in the area, because we treat folks right. Because people like um, some of my members in Quint's organization, we gave you food, we gave you breakfast, we gave you drinks and coffee, and other places can't do that. But we showed good old Pensacola hospitality, and the folks came out. So please keep that date, for save a date, September 21st of this year, first in-person event for the Office of Plier Diversity event for the entire state. And we heard some great connections today. There was one lady that came here earlier, she said, you know what, Brian, I've been trying to find my electrician and get him, him to do my work for me. I couldn't get a hold of him for weeks. I saw him today, and now we worked out a deal to get my work my house fixed. I said, dang, isn't that powerful? You know, we saw Paul Nobles working with SCI now. Paul used to be the purchasing director here, and we had a connection in place, and Paul has gotten people working through SCI to help you out with, with, your, uh, with your request for information, with your documents to work with the county and the city and stuff. Do you know how powerful it is to have a person that's going to help you do that personally? And it all started out with a connection me and Paul had years ago, but even when Paul retired from the county, we kept going, and it's going to be a great benefit to our whole community with his expertise helping us out helping you guys out with proposals and everything else. So guys, it's all about connections, as Bruce mentioned earlier. Find people you know, be willing to share, talk to them, ask questions, and get the answers you need. And please forgive me if I don't respond back as quick as I can. I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> it's my own personal problem, but I'm working on it, and I'll try to be better at it. And thank you again, everyone, for coming out today. We appreciate it. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Mr. Hall, who did a wonderful job pulling this together. And uh, everyone have a great weekend. Thank you very much, Brian. I'm going to wrap up really, really quickly. It was my brain thrust through Commissioner Lumen May. <laughs> That's how this all kind of came about. But I'm going to be very, very brief. I want to thank, it wasn't me, it was my staff. These guys came together and they made this happen. I had an idea that Commissioner May wanted a conference put together to really advance our minority business and let people know that we're sincere about putting money in the hands of minority businesses. I just took it from there, and I put together a team that has been phenomenal. Laura and her leadership, uh, Claire, all the people that Brian thanked, and each vendor that's out there. I sincerely thank you guys. And I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna close this up very, very succinctly. I wanted three things to happen today, three. I wanted you all to get an understanding from the county's perspective of the vendor registry system. That's where you need to be in so you can find out what contracts are available and what opportunities. If you don't know what the opportunities are, it doesn't matter what company you have, you can't, you can't be successful. You gotta have 
a door to knock on for opportunity. Second thing is Bruce and the minority business certification, that is a critical, critical, critical piece. It puts you in the game with three players. It puts you in the game with the state of Florida. It puts you in the game with the city of Pensacola. It puts you in the game with Escambia County and all the other counties across this great state. It is a critical thing. It's a little time consuming sometimes. I'm sure they've trimmed it down a lot from the days when I was there. But take the time to do that and get that information to you. It'll make a difference in your company. And the final thing is what Bruce has said, it's what Brian has said. People do business with people they know and they get comfortable with. Make connections. That's what this was all about today, getting people together. I wanted you guys to find the players in the room. I wanted you to see Jeff Lovingood from, the, from uh, Scambia County. These people make a difference. It's easy when you can pick up the phone with somebody you've met, had a connection with, you know the opportunities that exist, and you know what kind of skill set you have. You put those together, there's a chance for an opportunity and a ch chance for success. And I want to thank each and every one of you individuals that showed up. You all make a difference. I'm trying to help. There are a lot of people out there trying to help. But unless you step up to the plate like you did by showing up on a Saturday afternoon, and I greatly appreciate it. So with that, I close. I thank you. And I'll see you next year. I'm s Laura? Uh, there are surveys. Please put the survey on your table, finish them up, and we'll collect them later this afternoon. But again, thank you all. Be safe, be fun, and be prosperous. Thank you. Bye-bye.